Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, joined, of course, by Paul Sherwin here. And welcome to World Cycling Productions, 101st Paris-Roubaix. And by the way, it's our 13th consecutive year of coverage. And the reason we're talking to you from the square here in Compiègne the day before the great race is because we're now bringing you more coverage than ever. And we intend to show you the riders over all of the 26 sections of Parve. And Paul had to come here to the team presentation and catch up with the riders. Before we go to some of those interviews, though, Paul, everybody's saying this should be the race of last year's winner, Johan Museo. Well, everybody says that, but it's always very difficult to be the number one favourite. Yes, Museo, I think, is probably the strongest bike rider in the race. I actually think he's got the best team with Quickstep. But maybe for the first time in the last five or six years, they might make a mistake. All right, well, other names to think about. Peter Van Pietigum, if he wins this, he'll double up with his win in the Tour de Flanders last week. And that's the first man to have done that double since Roger de Vlaming back in 1977. The route this year, though, Paul, if this weather's with us tomorrow, it's going to be, what, a fairly fast race? It should be a very fast race. I think the difficult thing is that once we get over the first section of cobblestones, with it being dry, what will happen is all the riders who have dropped will have a very serious chance of coming back up again. So we'll see a lot more fighting for position going into the latter stages of cobbles. That, I think, also, to me, Phil, makes the Forest of Arenberg even more important because I could see 130, 140 riders charging into the forest together, and that'll be dangerous. Well, I won't be there. Paul and I will be down at the finish doing commentary. But now let's go to some of the interviews Paul has already done with the riders as they came here into the square in Compiègne for the team presentation. And then, by the magic of television, we'll be at the start. Well, Max, it's an important day, Paris-Roubaix. And uh, the fact that George Hincap is not here gives you quite a bit of freedom. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, I wish George was here because then it's, it's nicer to race in the final. But George is not here and uh, I'm going to try to do with Akimov. He, I think he's also good. He, uh, one time I think it was fifth, so uh, he can do also very well. So uh, it's not only George, but I think with uh, Aki and me, we can do a good uh, job in the final. It's a little bit different, the tactics, because uh, without a man like George Hincapie, you and Akimov actually have more freedom to watch the other teams. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but but still, I hope next year George is back. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's more comfortable when you have uh, riding like George in the in the spring. Uh, you're you're more relaxed now. We have to do it, and uh, are we gonna try? And uh, I hope it's gonna be well. So, what will your tactic basically be for the day to keep a close eye on the movements of Quick Step? Yeah, I think uh, they're the team to beat here. Uh, the other years are riding with him, and now we're uh, going to try to race against him. So, okay. Well, Tony, the tactics this year for Paris-Roubaix are going to be a little bit different because there isn't the sole leader, George Hincapie. That'll give everybody a bit more freedom. Yeah, definitely. Although, Eki and Max have shown the last few races that their form's really well, and they're definitely going to be the protected guys. But uh, my objective really is to try and get them into the cobble sections within the first, you know, 20 guys, try and recover, and then once it comes down to a select group, if I can show the directors that I'm still there, I'm still going good, then, then it opens up. Fortunately, it looks as if it's going to be a, a very fast Paris-Roubaix. The weather conditions are superb for a change. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to suit me more this year. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Max van Hazewick has proved over the last couple of years that he's the kind of rider who could actually be a surprise winner of a race like this, but he has to watch the, the maneuvering of the other teams. Yeah, Max, he's, uh, he's definitely capable of winning this race, and with the form that he has and what we've seen, you know, the past few weeks, I look for him to be within the top ten, no problem. Ah, thanks. Well, Dirk Demol, it's uh, pretty good fun being a team manager, but when you come to a race that you've won before, you must be just a little bit more nervous. Yeah, this time of, this, this time of the year, I'm always uh, more nervous because uh, everybody reminds me on, on my victory in 88, so yes. Difficult for the team this year to have a specific tactic to dominate because you don't have George Hincapie, but two good men, Yatislav Ekimov and Max van Hayswick. Yeah, that's right. So uh, it's a completely different team uh, than we got like in the past years because we did all the classics always with uh, one leader, with George. Um, so he, it's a pity he's not here, but uh, okay. Uh, but we have two riders who are going well so far. And uh, so Ricky and uh, Max, uh, we have the confidence in them for sure because it's dry. For Max, it doesn't matter, but for Ricky, uh, he preferred dry weather and they gave dry tomorrow. So um, let's hope. 
Team tactics also probably mean that you'll have a lot more riders in at the finale because in the past you've sacrificed the team just for George. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we have we have here we have two riders um, who came straight from the cir circuit last Saturday. So Stefan Giergaard and uh, Victor Ujo Pena. So uh, these guys they take care of uh, our two leaders before the first uh, couples, and uh, we have more we have more riders to send in uh, in breaks this year. Yes. And uh, you have confidence in the possibility of Van Hayswick getting onto the podium. Yeah, that's, uh, let's say it's a real target. Uh, we've got last year uh, somebody on the podium and we tried again, but uh, honestly, uh, if we have the two guys in the final, it should be already, it should be already uh, something, and, uh, but we want more and uh, we try to go on the podium again. Well, Yatislav, in the past, it's been a question of uh, looking after George Hincapie a lot for Paris-Roubaix, but uh, this time you've got a chance to ride for yourself. Um, well, that means, uh, that means if the team lost the leader, they, they, anybody can be a leader there. I mean, any good, any good guy. So that what happened this year. We missed the George and Kavi, but we have our, uh, Max von Hayswick and me. It's also, I think, important for a race like Paris-Roubaix to have the motivation. It is a big event, and you have the knowledge of having ridden this race many times. Uh, this is the one of the race that, uh, that the tactics almost decide nothing. You have to be strong and you have to be... Uh, uh, yeah, just strong and follow the guys and uh, try to be in the last 20 kilometers. And there you can do some, there you can play some tactics. But also, it's I think probably important for you because uh, the weather is not as bad as it had been in, in previous occasions. Yeah, for me it's just perfect. Uh, when it stays dry and uh, maybe a little windy, it's just perfect for me. And I um, just pray it's good that will be like that. It's quite nice to have a track finish as well because uh, you know how to handle the bends. <laughs> yeah, but the last lap in the cross. I mean, in one lap you cannot do anything there in the lap <laughs> and the track. <laughs> well, Freddie, we're coming into a part of the season that uh, in the past has always been a very important part of the season for you. How do you fancy your chances for Paris-Roubaix? Uh, I fancy that pretty much I'm riding well now. You know, I've had a couple, a month, about a month, where I've, been, I've had some sicknesses and some bad crashes. So it hasn't been, luck hasn't been on my side, but I feel like in the last couple of days I've really come around. My motivation's been really strong for this year. Just think, things haven't uh, turned out the way I've wanted them to. So when it comes to uh, the motivation I have for, tom for tomorrow, it's, it's probably the, the highest I've had so far this year. I see that Jean-Luc Bortolami has been riding pretty well over the last 10 days as well, and he's obviously pretty motivated to try and get himself onto the podium again as he did a few years ago with Mape. Yeah, but our, our main, our, our key is to have Bortolami, Weinsteins, and myself at the finale so we can have numbers to, to play our cards. I think uh, neither, uh, between three of us, we, we should have a better card. Uh, one of us should have a card to play at the end, and that's, the, that's always the key in the Roubaix is having numbers. It's also probably going to remain dry for the cobblestone sections, and that maybe means there's going to be a lot more riders towards the end. I think you prefer it when it's a bit more acrobatic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've only done Roubaix once, but it it seemed to suit me the fact that uh, it, it elim eliminates a lot of riders that uh, are scared of pavé, can't handle the bikes as well. Uh, for me, you know, I had some bad experiences, some bad crashes. I don't think they were my fault, but um, I think it, it, it suits me well when it when it rains, but not, now I'll have to try it on dry surface, see what happens. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Quite strange, you moved away from US Postal to come to Quick Step, and now you're being pushed into the role of uh, almost second favorite with Yoan Museo. Yeah, but uh, about your best race, you have to, you have to ride first, and uh, there's a big factor of, of good luck in it, and uh, it's always easier for a team to start with uh, two favorites. And for my case, uh, it would be better to ride with Johanna. He's a guy everybody's watching, and maybe I can ride a little bit behind him and try to get in a good, a good group uh, early in the race. Pretty nasty crash after Gent Wavel game. Did you manage to get over it okay? Yeah, I was really lucky. It was uh, good luck with an unfortunate crash, but... Uh, I can break something uh, in that crash, it was no problem, but uh, I came out of it okay, uh, just a little bit stiff in the neck, and, uh, but I came okay, to, for tomorrow it will be okay. The big power of a team like Quickstep is when you come to the end of a race like this, they do have the option of so many good riders who are in still with a chance. 
Yeah, that's, I think that's what I said. Uh, it's always easier to start out with two or three or four guys even. And uh, if somebody has bad luck, uh, you always have one or two guys you can count on. And this is this team uh, the case. You have four guys who can win the race. A little bit more nervous than last year? Not really. Thanks. Nico, it's a, a very important race, Paris-Roubaix, for Cofidis, which is a team from the north of France. It's good to see you in good form and also Philippe Gaumont coming back as well. Yeah, we are a team of the north of the France, so uh, we are really motivated to, to do a good race tomorrow. So um, Sunday I did a good race in France, I was fifth position, so I, I'm, I'm ready to, to do a good race tomorrow, but you must have a lot of chance also. But also the team Quickstep, they're very strong and I think in the last 20k, last 30k, they're going to be three or four or five riders in the front. So when I'm alone, it's going to be difficult to win. But in the past, Team Coffee just have actually always done a lot of work in the first part of the race. So somebody's been isolated at the end. Would it not be a better tactic to sit back and allow other teams to work so there can be you, Gomor, maybe someone else? Last year I did uh, I maybe 100 kilometers in the front, but it was a mistake. So now I try to, to follow. Just I think I'm going to follow you and Monsieur a little bit. So he's a good, uh, he had a lot of experience in this race. So I try to follow you on and uh, VDB because uh, my two, the two riders are going to be strong tomorrow. It's Monsieur and VDB. Is it good for you to see VDB, who is a very good friend of yours, coming back to the top of the sport? Yeah, why not? He's young. He's, he's 29 years old, so he, had on, he has, I think, four or five years to go. So now he's okay in his head. He had no problems anymore. He has everything to, to become a champion. But now he's on a good way, I think. And I hope he, he tried to continue this way he is now. What about a race like this? Why is there for some riders a special motivation to ride well in Paris-Roubaix? It's a specific race. You have stones. It's very. You have only one race in the year. It's Paris-Roubaix, who is very Liège, Baston Liège. It's with hills, but in Spain you had also hills. So in, it's, in Spain you you can't find find the stones of really typical typical of the France. So. That's what made uh, Paris-Roubaix so special. Okay, thank you. Well, Max, this might be the last time you ride Paris-Roubaix. I've heard that so many times. I hope it's not. But uh, what's, been, uh, what's been happening this last week since Flanders? Well, uh, as I saw you the last time in the hotel before Tour of Flanders, I said I had a problem with my leg. And uh, till a couple of days ago, actually, I didn't even know if I was going to be here. But everything turned to be in the right way, and I feel really good. As you say, it's maybe the last one, so it's, it's now or never, you know. I'm really motivated. I want to do well, you know, I've got experience. i got everything on my side. I hope it's going to be a good weather tomorrow, so I'm going to go for it. The thing is, the weather is such an important part of Paris-Roubaix. A dry Paris-Roubaix usually means that there's still a very large group together when we get towards the latter section of cobblestones. Yeah, that's true. Uh, last year with the wet, the last couple of years actually, it broke up really well. Uh, for this year, you can't really, you can't really say. Yeah, usually it's going to be a bigger group, but obviously it's still going to be the same riders at the end. You know, I mean, the, the strongest are going to come out. Well, everyone's talking about Quickstep and Johan Musel, but what about Max Chiandri? Well, obviously they're talking about Quickstep because it's the strongest team, the strongest riders. Uh, these guys know really what the race is made of, but there's still some indi individual riders out there, kind of like myself, but you know, can take advantage of this. Thank you. But Roger, great riding game, Wavell game. You must have been pretty psyched to be in uh, that group with all the big names. Yeah, it was nice. I mean, uh, to be in the front group racing for the win with guys like that, yeah, it was it was good. And then uh, to get the comments from Yosa, Yo Museo after the race that saying that, you know, I was strong. Yeah, it was made my day, really. You started your career off as a very good cyclocross rider, in fact, a world champion. 
you must have a bit of extra motivation for a race like Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, it's always been my dream race. Um, I've never, never hidden the fact. Um, if I never ride the Tour de France, if I never ride the Olympic Games, I won't mind as long as I've ridden Paris-Roubaix. So for me, tomorrow is the biggest race of my career ever. So. The sad thing is that uh, maybe the weather conditions are slightly against your advantage of being a great cyclocross man, because I think it's going to be pretty fast. Yeah, they're saying it's dry weather and warm weather, but um, uh, to be honest with you, with, the, with dry weather for my first time, I'm not too disappointed. Um, you know, we haven't had the opportunity to ride the ride the uh, the cobblestone sections yet, so if it was really bad weather, I think it might be too much of a, a big bite to take in one step. So. With good weather this year and hopefully bad weather next year when I've got a bit more experience. The difficult thing about Paris-Roubaix really is you have to get into the first section of cobblestones in the first 15 or 20 men. Then after that, you've got to keep doing exactly the same thing for the next 26 sections. Yeah, that, that's uh, I've heard it from a lot of people that the first section of cobbles, you've got to be in the front and sit, stay there for the rest of the race. So I think, you know, it, it just proves how hard Paris-Roubaix is. I mean, the, the first section of cobbles comes quite early. So from then on, you're riding flat out to the finish. So, it, you know, it just, just shows in the results there's nowhere to hide. And generally, the strongest guy wins. So, you know, hopefully I've got good form. And hopefully I can get to the front on the first section of cobbles and just see how long I can last. Cheers. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bloody good ride, that. Cheers, mate. Very good. Andrea, maybe this is going to be the last time you ride Paris-Roubaix. And maybe that's nice to know. Yes, this race uh, for me is a um, uh, race is very, very special. And uh, I don't know if this is the last, but I'm sure I want, uh, I want to go tomorrow very, very fast. Because uh, I think I have uh, all, I'm old, but I have uh, more motivation to go very fast. But Sean, uh, thinking about Paris-Roubaix, maybe you could ride this event because I heard you had a bike race this week. Yeah, I did, but um, I think I've come up a bit short in this race, you know, against this opposition. Andrea Taffy had a bit of a tough time last week, but he still says he's very motivated and got a great chance of doing well in Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, this, this race is much more suited to his style. So, you know, he's very confident. It's a week on. Flanders is not really up his alley. Tomorrow's a different story, and I'm sure I'll lay money on that he'll be there. Will you be more nervous than uh, many of the other races? As a rider, you were always very nervous for the week of Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. I mean, yes, these are the biggest races there is in my book, you know, and obviously Andrea is very, very focused, so... It would be tense. Until the race settles down, it would be very tense. What can you actually do to beat the, the quick-step block? Isolate them. I mean, we can't wait for them to dictate. Andrea has to go a long way out, I think, well, reasonably, and, and try and isolate them a bit. We don't want to follow them. Try and do some damage in the Forest of Arenberg? Maybe, maybe. But they're still a long way. So certainly after that, it will be slimmed down and it'll be clear to see what they have to do. Peter, last week you won the Tour of Flanders. Can you now start Paris-Roubaix a little bit more relaxed or still with the same pressure? Well, I think uh, I've, I have won the uh, Tour de Flanders, but you come on the start of Paris-Roubaix and uh, I think the, it's the same pressure. Uh, you want to win uh, this race and if you are not uh, really motivated, uh, you don't start. Uh, in this race you have really... It's very difficult to be a lone leader in a race like this when you come up against a team like Quickstep who have so many different men who can attack you. Yeah, but I think I have a good team. Uh, a lot of riders were also sick and the last weeks, they, for this race, typical uh, flat race and stone, uh, I have a good team. Do you think everybody may well make the mistake of looking at Johan Museo and maybe it's another rider from Quickstep who puts you under pressure? Um, I think uh, Johan is the the greatest leader and uh, I think uh, everybody will ride for him. And you'd like to win Paris-Roubaix and maybe have him second? I hope uh, I will be with him on the on the track and uh, in the sprint we will see. Okay. Stuart, great performance last week in the Tour of Flanders, the best ever classics performance you put in, uh, maybe giving you a few hopes now for Paris-Roubaix. I was certainly, certainly put on a different perspective of, of uh, World Cups. You know, realistically, I didn't think I had that. Uh, I was capable of that kind of result. So now, you know, 
Uh, I'm not going to say that tomorrow is going to come any easier, but you know, it just uh, changes the confidence and gives you, a, you know, a different outlook on the races like Paris Roubaix. Well, there's no such thing as an easy Paris Roubaix, but with the confidence of a performance like that and the weather conditions, maybe more to your advantage. Yeah, I think um, you know the team is lacking a bit of HP, you know, without Tor Hushoft and uh, you know the kind of pressure's been thrown my way. So you know the team have really got to just help me out the first 150k, keep me out of trouble. And, and then it's just the legs that will talk for, from there on. So, um, as you said, there's no easy power Bay. Uh, I've just got to hope for no, um, no crashes, no punches, and, and then see in the last 50k. Well, we saw a great performance in the week by your former teammate, Hank Vogels. Do you think coming into a race like Paris Bay with performances like that behind you, you can be just a little bit more relaxed? Um, it, yeah, it does take a certain amount of pressure off you, for sure. I mean, the Classics, uh, you know, it's a big part of the, the start of the season. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on it. Um, and to get a result's really great just to know that the form's there. Um, you know, I, the, I was lucky enough to go home and recover instead of doing good in Wobbegum, so I think that's probably a bit better build up for, for Paris Bay. So we'll see you tomorrow. What, why is Paris Bay so special? Because it's so hard. Uh, it's just an adventure. I mean, it's, there's no race like it in the world. Um, it's, just, it's just a huge adventure. And, um, it's a bit mad. It's bloody crazy. <laughs> it's, it's as mad as it can be, but I mean, if you go in with the outlook. Um, and enjoy it. It can be a, a sick, in a sick way, it can be fun. Uh, thanks. And it's a wonderful spring day here in France. The peloton, though, have got the work cut out. They're riding at a very high average speed, running over 10 minutes ahead of the expected arrival time. And as we pick up the action now, they've yet to start the first cobblestones of the day. But there is a breakaway of 14 riders. The last time check we got was four minutes and 45 seconds. Look at this, it's a mass oh. pileup. There's riders all over the place here. Well, this is a, a complete standstill here, which means the race at the head, of course, is going forward. This is an amazing uh, delay. Well, a lot of riders, there was a huge crash in the middle, though. That was Rob Hales there. One or two riders going off to the left-hand side here. There's still a long way to the first section of cobblestones, and this is all because of the fact that everybody is very, very nervous to get into the first section of cobbles at Troisville. Just sneaking through there wearing number 14 was, in fact, Andreas Clear, the man who a couple of days ago won himself a very nice race in ghent Wevelgem. There's the chaos at the back, but you can be almost certain the big names like Johan Musea would have been in the front 15 or 20 places when this happened. Well, that's rather sad to see uh, one of the riders of Mina Vacanzi down there. I think it was uh, Ongarato who was in trouble. But they're losing a lot of time here. The race speeding away from them now. And this before we reach the cobblestones. Just one rider there from the Sidermac team. They're not looking at all well. Well, let's hope it's not uh, Herman Weinsteins because he's been sitting at the back quite a lot. He, too, has had a lot of bike problems in the early part of this race. Now, yeah, well, it looks as though he was OK there, Paul. Actually, coming around as we speak, uh, this here is uh, Pagliarini. Luciano Pagliarini had a wonderful race in Malaysia, but already his race is done. Well, it's very difficult when you lose so much time on the charge into the first section, the top of cobblestones at Troisville, to actually pull yourself back into the bike race because the main field right now, Phil, are probably charging along at an average speed of around 50 kilometres an hour. These riders were the men already riding, Phil, in the first 15 to 20 places. This peloton doesn't look that big. Remember, we have 14 riders up ahead. Last time check, uh, four and three-quarter minutes. The fact we've had a, quite a big pilot, one of the biggest I can remember on these early roads. We're looking now at Andri Kashikin, the Kazakhstan rider on quick step. And I think, he, yes, he is. Aria de la Corse, he is chasing back. They've lost a powerful workhorse there in the opening kilometres of the cobbles. They certainly have. Rob Hales there, the man at the back with number 94, the coffee dish rider. A little bit of un unfortunate luck for him over the last couple of years, but I am hearing on race radio that Tom Boonen has also been caught up in this crash. We haven't seen him yet, but when this happens on the roads of paris roubaix there is so much chaos when everybody tries to pull themselves back into the race. This is Jimmy Casper. We saw him down a little bit earlier on. 
but it will be a long, hard chase for these guys to try and reintegrate the front end of the race. You can see the main field have speed up, sped up quite dramatically over the last few kilometers because from 4 minutes and 45 seconds, it's come down to 4 minutes. We're in the first section of cobblestones right now, and this is where we're looking out to see what sort of conditions the cobbles will be in today. There hasn't been any overnight rain, and in fact, we are announcing a temperature towards the end of the day of around about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which really is quite remarkable. Sector one, they'll get used to being shaken around now as it's Lodo here and Battagliati driving on at the head of the race. Well, Paul, what's the best way to ride the cobbles? The only way to ride the cobblestones is to try and get in the first three or four places, especially if you're in this leading group right now, because you have the ability then just to pick your way over the cobblestones and avoid the places where one or two of them are missing. The other thing to do is not to hold the handlebars too tight either. You just need to relax your hands in the middle of the bars and let the front wheel actually cruise over the, the cobblestones and then it really allows you to make sure you get the smoothest ride possible. And of course, if you've got the power, you use as big a gear as possible on these stones because the faster you go, the more you tend to glide over the surface. Having a little bit of a problem hanging on here at the tail is Wesley Van Spreybuck of the Landbau credit team. And just ahead of him is Corey Sweet, the Australian rider on Credit Agricole. The biggest problem here, and a, a little glimpse of the Belgian flag, they're indicating the tailwind. These riders are enjoying the fact that they've come up over 10 minutes on expected arrival here. But these are the problems, Paul. Unlike the mud, a dust, I think, is possibly a worst enemy. It certainly is. It's very difficult because it comes up into the eyes. A lot of riders nowadays obviously using special glasses on days like this, and it is a hard thing to do because not only do we have the cars in front throwing up dust like this, but it makes it very difficult to breathe. And also for the guys at the back of the group like this, it makes it quite difficult to look round and see where the danger is going to come from. But as you said earlier, I think Van Speybrook at the back here for Landbau Credit having a very difficult time. And an interesting introduction to the uh, Paris-Roubaix for Corey Sweet there. He's 26 years of age, been a pro since 99, but now coming through as a big man on Credit Agricole after two years with the uh, Bank Giro lottery team. Well, the main field are not too far away from Troisville also, so I would think the next time we get a time check, it will have eaten into that 4.45 advantage they had about 20 kilometres ago. The last time check we had, it was down to the four-minute mark. And you can see here, it's at such a, an incredible speed these riders are hammering over the cobblestones today, Phil, and they've got a chance to go around these corners at almost maximum pace. Looks like Eddie Seigneur on the front here, no stranger at all to the cobblestones in the north of France. Got himself a chance to get back up to a new team. There, uh, you just got a chance to see how precarious it can be going around one or two of these corners there because uh, Corey Sweet nearly lost it there, Phil. You know, you can't afford to waste energy. You've got to try and not make mistakes and have to fight back to the wheels because you need every ounce of energy uh, for the stones which lie ahead. And now Corey is having to use a lot of energy now just to hang on to the tail of this 14-man breakaway on this first stretch. Thankfully, it's come to an end. So he's going to have to get up the gears now and try and get on to the tail before we get to the next sector. Eddie Seigneur, you see, great experience, former national champion of both the road and the time trial in France. OK, he's 34 years of age now, but he still uh, doesn't affect his brain how to read it and be in the right place. Well, he was in exactly the right place there right now. He was able to pick his way across the cobblestones. The strange thing about a race like Paris-Roubaix is that the slipstreaming effect is somewhat reduced going over the cobbles because the fact is everyone's a little bit wary about riding exactly on the wheel of the man in front. This is the front end of the main field right now, Phil. They're entering cobble section 26 to go and I would think we'll see an acceleration coming from the riders from quick step 2.2 kilometers of cobblestones there are 49.1 kil kilometers to go for this bunch and the chances are the reason of the big pileup just before we came to this section of cobblestones is the infighting that goes on to hold position at the head of the peloton because that goes on for a good hour before you reach here it goes on for a good hour and it will continue all the way to the finish in Rude Bay right now because every time we come to a section of cobblestones, because of the fact we've got very dry conditions this afternoon, I think we'll see the race splitting up on the cobblestones, coming back together, and then every time you approach a section, riders fighting to make sure they get in the first 15 or 20 places. So paris Roubaix, the 101st edition of this great, great race, which began in 1896. You're never disappointed with this race. The very nature of the course forces the riders to attack it. 
and there's always the element of the big gamble. Everybody agrees it's not just a strong man, but you do need luck. A punch at the wrong time can take away all of your strength. 3 minutes 38, the cobbles have caused the reaction from the peloton, aided, I suspect, by that massive pile-up in the centre of the big bunch. It's down to 3.38 now. Looks like the charge of the light brigade here, Paul, as they're going across the open roads of northern France. Whatever, whatever weather conditions you've got in this bike race, Paris-Roubaix, it always gives dramatic television pictures. It's an incredible bike race. It's like going back a few years. It's a very old-fashioned race, and it's amazing. The riders who come here are the riders who are absolutely motivated to ride Paris-Roubaix. Look at that. The riders picking their way through the column of smoke here from the motorbikes. It's quite remarkable. I think we're going to be in for a rather incredible bike race this afternoon. We may well even approach the fastest Paris-Roubaix that we've ever had, and that is held still by Peter Postville, which is absolutely remarkable. 45 kilometers an hour average speed. As we look here, the main part of the peloton, we're hearing that uh, up front, Corey Sweet has not got back to the leaders. He's some 100 meters behind and trying to get back. So he could be the first to go of that 14-man breakaway. The Bakers doesn't now try to move clear, 13 of them. Sharp left turn here, these riders going round completely blind, relying on the man in front not to make a mistake and hopefully choosing the best way. Absolute chaos there. If you're at the back of the main field, it is very, very difficult. Lotta Domo are the team now setting the pace on the front end of the main field. Obviously, Peter Van Pietigen wanted to make sure he got into the front part of these cobblestone sections because it's in the back 15 or 20 places where riders tend to have the majority of accidents because you're not really able to see exactly where you're putting your wheels and riders then are the ones those riders at the back are the ones subjected to flat tires or broken wheels still uh, three minutes 40 the latest check now on the peloton moving up to the leaders this is Malte Erbon the German rider on coast the other credit agricole rider still there Cedric Hervé so they'll be happy to be on the smooth roads now. The sun is on their backs. It's a lovely day for bike racing. And uh, somebody said earlier when we arrived at the comedy position, we could be commentating today on a stage of the Tour de France. What a change on the week, because it's been rather chilly all week. Well, this is the leading group right now. That's Eddie Seigneur just on the far side in the Jean de la Tour colours. And these guys, uh, they have been reduced in numbers just a little bit, Phil, as they come off the first section of cobblestones, but you can see they've got themselves organised once again. They realise that to try and survive, they have to keep working as a very strong group. Bramati going through. Earlier on, David Bramati of the dominant quick-step team was actually taking a, a big rest at the back end of the main field. I would think he'd be under orders not to contribute too much to the success of this early morning breakaway because they've got other plans in mind. Just over a kilometre now to section 25 of the cobblestones. We count backwards in this race. We start at 26, we finish at number one. And it's Battagliati here, the man that made his name in last year's Tour de France, who's pushing the great forward. He's got a teammate in here too, in Lodo. He's a pretty good track rider as well as a good road rider, and he might need some track skills on the surfaces which are still lying ahead of him. Kai Hundemark, the telecom rider, just pulling off after having done his move at the front. Team Telecom, I feel today, feel not exactly sure what sort of tactics to adopt because their man, uh, Stephen Weisserman, went down in a very bad crash in the Tour of Flanders race a week ago and suffered from a broken rib. And rather a shame because he felt he was going to be the first German to win this bike race in a very long time. About 101 years. <laughs> Yes, because the first winner was a Joseph Fischer of Germany and the German rider has never succeeded since. In fact, it's quite amazing as we watch here the next man in trouble, Wesley van Speybuck in the breakaway. Remember that we've already lost uh, Corey Sweet. But you know, since the first German winner, we haven't had another German rider win this race. And in fact, we've only had eight nations win the Paris Bay in all of these years, which I find quite amazing. 154 kilometres to go, the leaders on sector 25 now. This is an amazing race today. Just look at the splits here. Still trying to recover uh, from that massive pile-up, uh, but this bunch is still big if it can get together. 
Well, I think they may well, you can see the front end of the main field, they're just spreading across the road, they're slowing down somewhat before they accelerate for the next section of cobblestones, which is going to get thrown in their faces. Ted de la Course, you can see the caption there indicating this is the front end of the bike race, and obviously I have a feeling Eddie Seigneur wants to shine in front of his crowd. He is in fact a man from the north of France, he's a Picard by, uh, by region, and he raced as an amateur for an awful long time for the club of Saint-Quentin where the race went through after about 85 kilometres covered. And I hope that people saw them because they were going so quick there with a tailwind on a lovely day, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Well, moving to the back here, this is Julien Ladon, number 135. Front end of the group, still Eddie Seigneur. As I said earlier, Phil, it doesn't really make much difference if you do set the main pace making on the front here because everybody is suffering almost to the met they met the same amount but this man at the back here Loudin is having a difficult time staying in contact and I don't think he will be seeing the front end of the bike race anymore two men have now been dropped from this leading group which was 14 riders Corey Sweet losing it in a corner and it really is quite remarkable he used 50 meters on the cobblestones and that's it goodbye for the day well, we have met an awful lot of bike riders in the last couple of days who have ridden at all of the cobble sections of this route, and everyone, without exception, came and showed me their hands, Paul, and they were ripped to pieces because the blisters of riding the cobblestones. Well, that's uh, a lot of those riders were riders who are amateur riders and who don't spend that much time on the bike throughout the year. Many of these riders don't suffer from these sort of problems, and they don't really nowadays take any extra precautions. Many things have been tried throughout the years, increased thickness of handlebar tape, rubber cushioning underneath the handlebar tape but I uh, remember I raced this this event many many times probably seven times in total I took part in Paris-Roubaix and for most of the races I hardly e even used gloves over the top and I never got any blisters a tough man my mate Sherwin is such a tough man he, he never astounds me he just only tells the truth he was third by the way in the amateur Paris-Roubaix in itself no mean feat I have to confess well, I'll tell you one thing, there's a huge difference between the amateur Paris-Roubaix and the one we're watching here right now. Not only the, in distance, but also in the speed with which these men go over the cobblestones. One year I didn't participate in Paris-Roubaix after having had a, a serious crash in the Grand Prix of Denain on just the Thursday before the event. And actually went to the side of the road to see the bike race, Phil, and I was totally amazed at the speed that these men float over the cobbles. It really is remarkable to watch. You don't feel the same sensation of speed when you're actually riding. This is Kersipu on the front, a man who could put in a fine performance in today's weather conditions. This is a long section of cobblestones through to 3.7 kilometers. That's over two and a half miles. Sector 24 now at the Kievy Rue de Valenciennes. That poor old bunch behind, you see, they can't quite get on because they keep hitting the cobblestones now. The pressure will stay on all of the time. There's no sit up and look at the countryside. You are, your nose is on the extension and you've got to keep the pressure on and hope that somebody slows it down just a little bit. Roger Beauchat of the Phonak team, off to the right here. Sidemac on our left. The Sidemac rider there looks to me as though it's Raphael Diaz, or Monse rider, sorry. Well, that's the difficult thing once you do lose the wheel in a bike race like this it's so difficult to nail it back on the cobblestone section because the accelerations come every time you get onto the stones of the Kaseya is what they call it in Flemish and the men who are best at this are men like Van Pietigem, Johan Museo and they certainly want to make sure that they keep the pace as high as possible 24 sections to go this section here Phil is 3.7 kilometers in length and as you can see pressure is certainly on it is, because we're on the same sector now as the head of the peloton, which could mean they're closing in at a couple of kilometres behind, but that's probably a spread of just about three minutes on roads like this. And I've got a feeling we're down to probably uh, 11 riders in this break race, because I also think that Wesley Van Spabok lost contact, and we'll keep an eye out for that. He's number 217. So we could have now just 11 riders up front. To see uh, here, we're looking at the front. This is a man we normally see at the Tour de France, Garcia Acosta, an incredible by rider. Not very often do we see the Spanish riders ride so well in the north of France here on races like Paris Roubaix and the Tour of Flanders. But this man today has managed to get himself into the early morning breakaway. See how, as we look back at the main field, how it is completely and utterly stretched on 
and it seems to me as if they may well just have made contact with the front part of the peloton but there's a lot of riders still scrambling for survival at the back end of that group it's a long way from the steam engine back to the caboose by the look of it as the riders now have got together but uh, if the pressure is on and as soon as they come off these cobblestones riders at the back have got to scurry forward before we hit the next sector we're all in sector uh, 24 the leaders of the race antonio cruz near the back at the moment we're heading off sector 24 with the leaders i've got a feeling too we're down to probably just 11 sector 25 uh, they're saying so it must be further down the group here this is the tail of the peloton well we've still got uh, another section of cobblestones which will pop up here in a moment right in front of these bike riders this is stefan Heyergaard, and uh, this in fact is jan kersipu so i'd like to just have a little look back here right now because he was on the front end of the main field just a few moments ago a big strong bike rider very good sprinter and i would say phil a man ideally suited for a race over the cobbles like this well, he's won a lot of races, more than 100 in his career. He turned 100 this year, uh, but he hasn't excelled. He has got the big winner. There's another crash here. It's a faster Bortolo rider. It's not even off, is it? Doesn't look like even off who's gone down there right now, but this is why it is so dangerous. This is why you must always ride at the front in a bike race like Paris Roubaix. There's another man on the right hand side. Let's have a look just how he went down here. In fact, uh, we didn't get a chance to oh, see that, but I think. The problem is, Phil, it is so dry, we are going so fast, and these guys are actually slipping on the smooth, smooth sections of road, which has been covered with a small covering of dust. Well, this is the man that's causing the panic back there. He's ridden away from the front of the peloton by himself, and I'm not sure quite what he's doing here, Paul. It's still a long way to go for Kersey Poop, who hasn't had a, a result in Paris Roubaix before. He's a strong bike rider. You can see he's opened up quite a gap there right now. What he's trying to do is provoke a split at the front end of the main field and he's opened himself up an advantage here of around about 100 meters over the main field these are fabulous pictures we're looking at here of paris roubaix absolutely remarkable i can see a csc rider in about 10th or 15th place earlier on andrea taffy had two bike changes out on the road before we came to the first section of cobblestones at trois and right now i have a feeling he must have reintegrated the front end of the main peloton but this is a rather brave move by Jan Kersipu. I'm not quite sure, as you said, Phil, why he's doing it. The only reason I can expect is that he's hoping that a small group of 15 or 20 riders comes off the front end of the main field. As he knows, it most certainly will. They're heading up to the famous Forest of Arnberg shortly, but there's still a lot of trouble before we get there. And Kersipu at the head, he's sort of stuck in between now with these 11 leaders here in the uh, second in the league group rather we'll keep an eye out and see if we can get some more pictures of them for you and here we are up at the front again now and it looks to me indeed that eddie senior slipped to the back of this group now probably wondering what happened to his teammate in the breakaway i beg your pardon no he's on the latour now so he hasn't got a teammate in the breakaway we're on to sector 24 i think at the moment we might have just crossed over to sector 23. this race is moving so quickly we are poised for a wonderful Paris Bay this year. There's no question about that already. Lots of action. And that's a Vincenti Garcia of Boston. No Spanish riders ever won this race. And Ivan Esto have got a man as Paul putted in the early morning breakaway. I wonder what he feels like right now, Phil, because uh, he really is riding at the front end of this bike race. And uh, strangely enough, we always call it the early morning breakaway, but over the last couple of years, they've actually changed the start time of Paris Roubaix. It always used to start very, very early on at about 9.30 in the morning. And over recent years, they pushed it further and further back for the television viewership to be increased. And I have to say, this is probably one of the most watched single-day classic races. So end of sector 24. Goodness knows where Malta Urban had been just then, but he came out from the side there over the grass. And uh, a Kersi problem Poo. with Poo. Well, he's had a well, front blow out there, Phil. And he's uh, going to take a... A little bit of time to get going in, but that is really rather unfortunate because he was storming away, opening up an advantage of 100 metres. The advantage of being off the front on your own, like a section of cobblestones like this, is you can get the possibility of a very quick bike change. Well, There's at least he punctured in the lead, which is a place to puncture, and he had a wheel at hand because most of the wheels are given from uh, neutralised motorcycles on the race, passing wheels up, but at least uh, he was able to get straight back into the sharp end of the chase group. And rather than have to chase back now from the rear. There he is, uh, Kersi Poo. Still looking pretty cool at the moment. 
peloton here just take a look into that peloton when we get the close-ups look at their faces tom Steele's down there champion of belgium they are all concentrating watching the wheel in front hoping that guy makes no mistakes because they know they'll all go down together it's a big peloton has reorganized itself here on sector 24 of 26 sections the leaders themselves are rapidly scurrying up now a little bit of a gap before we get up to the next sector at uh, saint piton and that will leave us 113 kilometers from the finish but again that's another very long section of cobblestone sector number 23 this is for the leaders it's 1500 meters in length this is the section that goes from Kievy to saint piton and again these are the very difficult early parts i think we're going to see the same scenario fill over the next 30 40 kilometers or so the main field splitting up and coming back together but once we get to what i always feel is the first real difficult section of cobblestones the section of the forest of Arenberg, that's when the main field will almost certainly be reduced in dramatic numbers senior again the senior the top man in the breakaway with the most experience hits the cobbles on sector 23 and drives the race forward and his skill a little bit too much for the other riders hanging on now at the back here uh, from the credit agricole team it's Cedric Hervé Hervé the only one left for the team and it looks like it might be his turn to say au revoir uh, to the leaders they're down to 11 men in this breakaway from the 14 he's just trying to find uh, a little bit of solace there in the grass on the left of the road well, that's the difference between the big champions and a guy just trying to survive in a breakaway like this. You very rarely will see a man like Johan Museo or Andrea Taffy taking the risks at the side of the road there, especially on a dry day like this, because it's in that gutter there where you do tend to suffer much more chances of a flat tyre. Eddie Seigneur riding a superb race at the front of this breakaway here right now, because after all, this man was an exceptionally strong bike rider in the early part of his career. He was dogged by some serious knee problems, but it seems that he's got all of that behind him right now as he's come back up to rejoin the Jean de la Tour team. Here is Bertogliati at the back. He's quite comfortable in this group, and a man really not doing an awful lot to contribute to the pacemaking is David Bramati, because he's got another job in hand later on, when I'm sure we will see the big quick-step trio, Boonen, Museo, and, of course, Vandenbroek move forward. A lot of people uh, putting their money on Frank van der Broeke today to really come out of the Dolphins and become the champion he once was. But he may have to take on the team captain, Johan Museo, and indeed Tom Bowen, who continues to improve. And Tom was third last year when he was looking after George Hincapi. Sadly, no Hincapi in the race. He's back home and sick, but they do seem to have found the problem out. And hopefully, George will be back here in Europe pretty soon. Now, looking at the front end of the peloton, and it's still a very big bunch. There'll be no immediate panic now. They've got over the crash. Those that were strong have come back into the group. The rest won't make it. And they'll now assess the situation. There's still a long way to go. Not perhaps so much in kilometres, although there's still a long way in that respect, but in the type of roads which they've got to uh, encounter. Well, so we've got that Dirk there, Steichel on the front, uh, and uh, he speaks very good English. Youngster riding his first Paris-Roubaix. Looking over his shoulder, probably for the whereabouts of the top dog, Eric Zabel. And that looks as though it might be Corey Sweet who has now come back from the leaders. Well, he should be soon back in the main fold. I did see at the front end of the main peloton there, Max van Heeswijk. So obviously riding very carefully over the cobbles at the moment. He will be, I think, helped an awful lot today by a man by the name of Yatislav Ekimov who was actually hoping to re revel in these conditions this afternoon. This is a completely different Paris-Roubaix to the ones of previous years when the riders have had to battle with mud. This is Benoit Joachim on the front, rode a very good Tour of Flanders just over just a week ago today. And I think the team, US Postal, will have a slightly different kind of tactics today on a race like this because they will not be looking after the lone leader who in the past has always been George Hincapie put to the uh, other side of the Atlantic right now, trying to recuperate from what was initially thought to be a viral infection, but now after about, I think, Phil, um, almost a month of searching, been put down to a parasite which should be cured very, very quickly, and we should see George back in fine form when we come to the Tour de France. And let's hope you're right. Uh, as the Seiko rider, Jörg Ludwig, has brought the peloton onto sector 23, and this might shake one or two of them out, sitting at the back here, Gerald Steiner's and Robert Foster. Very good sprinter, good circuit race rider, by the way, but I'm not sure he'll like the big circuit of Paris-Roubaix. 
and dodging the holes here, Danny Bertolini, the Italian, on the phone axe system. Bit of chaos here at the back end of the main field. That's why it is so important to take the risks, use a little bit of extra energy to ride in the front 15, 20 places because it really is difficult to ride on the back end of the group. Riders zigzagging all over the place trying to find the smoothest piece and the, the Phonak rider there you were talking about, Phil, he really is zigzagging, looking to try and find himself just a little bit of slipstream. Looking down here. This is uh, the quick step team now, Cerves Carnarvon, the former winner of this bike race. He's staying to the front end of the main peloton. Max Van Hazewick is there as well. Nothing at all so far it has appeared of Johan Museo. I still think Museo is in with a very good chance of getting himself a fourth win. But the man who might beat him could come from his own team. A lot of people really do believe today that Frank van den Broeke has a great chance of winning this bike race. And at the end of the day, with a team as strong as Quickstep, it does come down to a lot of tactical manoeuvring. Now, sector number 23. There were 11 leaders uh, taking this sector first. We're now back with the peloton. As they continue to maintain what is a very high speed. The peloton was uh, not due here until around about 2 o'clock local time. So we're now running some... 18 minutes ahead of expected arrival on this sector of the cobblestone. It's going to be a very quick race today. Maybe we'll endanger the long-standing record of that great Dutchman, Peter Poss, who still holds the record here. In fact, the advantage of the leaders, Phil, has stretched out just a little bit, which is somewhat surprising. That's probably because of the chaos at the back end of the race for the moment. And they've stretched it out to 3.39. But as we get closer and closer to the forest of Arenberg, you will see that st start to be reduced. Carrying on now, this will be sector 22 now for the leaders, and Batagliati is in a little bit of trouble here, as uh, he is now being unhooked at the back. Next man to be put in trouble. It's only 900 metres, or maybe he was not in trouble. He's coming back well. well he probably had a problem with his gears there. He looked down a couple of times to see what the problem was, but it is so difficult when you lose that much ground on the cobbles to actually nail it back, unless you are a big superstar. Batagliati not panicking at the moment but it really is difficult for him to ride here he's got the wind full in his face although the riders started today with a very much of a cross tailwind for the first hundred kilometers or so once they get here to the cobble section right now they're turning east west north all of the time and they get a completely different wind pattern every section of cobblestone sometimes it's cross sometimes it's head and occasionally with a bit of luck it's tail well, I've always preferred a headwind to a tailwind, I did do, Paul, because when they pick up that tailwind, they go so quickly, and uh, that's what caused the breakaway to get clear and the splits in the peloton earlier. Now, look at this then. Now, that was a surprise. We have to say Frank Vandenbroek is out of Paris-Roubaix, and we don't know any more than what the screen is telling us, although we did see him at the back of the race. Well, that is a surprise because uh, pre-race he was regarded as one of the big favourites with Johan Museo and, of course, with Tom Boonen. I'm not sure whether or not we have any news on Tom Boonen right now, but I did hear his name earlier on, Phil, involved with that crash in the first part of the race. So that may well be uh, at the beginning of a bad luck story for Quick Step this afternoon. They're in a good situation right now because they have a man in the leading breakaway on the race, David Bramati, a very strong worker. And, of course, Johan Museo, you can be absolutely certain he's to the front end of the main field. Carnarvon, his teammate, is in this group as well. So still some of the big names, Stuart O'Grady. We get a quick glimpse of the Australian national champion on the far side. But I think right now everybody just sitting back a, a small amount, if they can, just to recuperate before the next section of cobblestones turn up. Sharp swing left. Uh, now it's Pave 22 for the peloton. And one poses the question, who will lose contact with the race this time through? There are 11 leaders. They've gone through and off here at this sector of Pave. And they're now only about 120 kilometres from the finish only. <laughs> but the roads uh, will uh, make up for any lack of distance. Museo so, must stay near the front. He knows that and keep out of trouble. I wonder if he realises now that Vandenbroek has gone. I would suspect he does. I would think that information has gone through quite quickly. Now, look at this. This really is quite remarkable. U.S. Postal Service on the front end of the main field there. Benoit Joachim is the man setting the tempo. And despite the fact that Georgie Hincapi is absent, I think these guys feel they've got a very good chance today with Max van Heeswijk and, of course, Yatislav Ekimov. 
Max tends to ride the cobblestones very well indeed, Phil. He doesn't use a huge gear. And in fact, uh, when we watched him earlier this season in the breakaway in Het Volk, he was very quickly onto the wheel of Johan Museo every time he accelerated on the cobbles. I think he has a great form this year, and uh, he could be the man for US Postal. Quite clearly, he's right up there, otherwise the team wouldn't be riding like this. So Max has a real chance. Talking with some of the team officials uh, the other day in the week in Belgium, they said there's no doubt about it. Max will be in at the kill today. So let's hope he can fly the flag, uh, the flag in the absence of the US postal rider, George Hincapi. Uh, just the long line, just look down that line, Paul. I, I, I could imagine you just there, last man on that far bend. What do you think? Well, I think I'd have to disagree with you there, Phil, because <laughs> I actually finished 15th in Paris-Roubaix, and it was a dirty day when I did that, and I got, did that by actually riding at the front end of the peloton. Um, but well, you must have done. 15th is a fantastic performance. And, I, in fact, uh, the most important thing for me on that day was to get into the forest of Arenberg in the first positions, and probably, I suppose, to, to come clean. The only reason I got into the forest of Arenberg in third position because I was looking after my uh, best man, Alain Bondu, who was a great rider when it came to Paris-Roubaix. He had a flat tyre three kilometres before the forest of Arenberg. I stopped at the side of the road for him, paced him back into the bike race. We circumnavigated the, the spectators. I got up alongside Francesco Moser, who was looking down and saying, what's this little squirt doing here? And I kept accelerating, and Moser just frowned at me, and I deposited Bondu at the front end of the bunch going into Arenberg. When we came out, I said to Alain, how many guys are in front? He said, this is the front. And then I realised I was going to have to do something pretty special. <laughs> Good on you. This is sector, sector number 21. It's a fairly long sector at 1.2 kilometres, and it's a sector known as Solzois. Back into the group, Ludovic Capella. And he seems to have put all of his health problems behind him as well. Let's not forget a former champion of Belgium. There's a great glimpse of just exactly what these cobblestone roads are like in the north of France. Eddie Seigneur today, Phil, is absolutely on fire. He wants to do every section at the front. I don't blame him if he can, because that's the place to be. This looks a particularly bumpy section here. As all of the breakaways seek their own course, you can't get much help from slipstreaming a rider in front. You've got to find your own way over these stones now. They know that Tom Steele's and Clear are at three minutes and seven seconds. The peloton just a few seconds further back. That's the situation on the road. Out of the race, Frank Vandenbroek, one of the pre-race favourites for victory today. He may well have been uh, caught up in that crash. Uh, he obviously got back to the peloton, but something's gone wrong. 131 kilometres still to race to the finish in Roubaix. It's a beautiful day, and uh, everybody in Roubaix, which is where we commentate from, are watching all of the action on a huge television screen. So it's not boring at all waiting for the arrival of Paddy Roubaix. Well, David Bramati was uh, the man on the quick step team at the front end of this group, making sure that he too was picking a very safe road across the cobblestone section here. Section number 21 of 26 cobblestone sections, making a total of 49.1 kilometres, 31 miles of cobblestones that these riders are facing this afternoon. This is the front end of the bike race, and this is the best place to be at the moment because it is much less chaotic here than it is in the main field. Every time the main field field comes up to the cobbles, it is absolute and utter chaos in the first 15 to 20 places. Everybody wants to be there. There's the leader of Fasa Bortolo, Fabian Cancellara. He's a man who could be a surprise name at the end of the day, an absolutely superb young bike rider, switching across from Mape to join Fasa Bortolo during the winter transfer season. The man we might have to keep a very close watch on later on this afternoon. You bet your life. There's OC for the main peloton now. Heading up towards the next sector of 21. These beautiful towns here in northern France. This is the Département du Nord here in France. Oh, they're saying it's Solzois for this group here at the moment. Well... The Vlaams Zulu, the Flemish Lion, they're all out in support of the man that everyone wants to win this bike race for a fourth time this afternoon, Johan Museo. He had a bit of a problem uh, last week in the Tour of Flanders when he was in the right place at every moment of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And when it came to the big attack on Tin Boss, he knew where to attack, but he just did not have what it took in those aging legs of his, 37 years of age. Right now, we're looking at the front end of the main peloton. Garcia Acosta still with a slight advantage, but these guys know the Spaniard and they're not going to give him that much of an advantage. This is the back end of the peloton. 
slipping off the bat, the man who uh, much earlier on in the day was in that breakaway, Van Speybroek from the Landbau Credit team. Just a little bit further in front, you can see the Boulanger team. Christoph Kern going out of the back, this is Speybroek. Just recovering somewhat, while well, Garcia Acosta has been brought back into the fold, so still 11 riders at the front of this bike race with around about a three and a half minutes advantage over the rest of the main peloton, Bertoliati, the man who took out the first stage of the Tour de France last year. Damien Nazon, a man to watch out for if it does come down to, in a, to a sprint towards the end of the stage. Great sprinter for France, a former cyclocross champion. But I have a feeling today we could see a great performance coming from the US Postal Service. There are an awful lot of their riders riding in the first 10 or 15 places in the main peloton, but suffering at the back for Jean de la Tour, Frédéric Finot. There's a problem here at the back. One of the CSC riders seem to have uh, a slight problem there. It's a back wheel puncture, Phil. And I didn't quite catch who it was going backwards quite that rapidly. Well, Van Speybroek here is hanging on. Remember, he was a man in the breakaway. And this looks like Andrea Tappi. I'll pick up his location here, but he's been changing his bikes on a couple of occasions uh, earlier before the big crash. Well, he obviously missed the big crash. And they're saying that uh, Tappi is a man for the race again today. He won it, remember, two years ago. Well, he's in the right place in the bike race right now because Taffy is on the front end of the main peloton. And obviously, uh, despite the large number of bike changes he had earlier on, he's in great form. His team manager, Sean Yates, told me yesterday there's nobody going to beat Andrea Taffy today in this Paris-Roubaix because of the weather conditions. And Taffy himself saying that uh, as long as the sun say stays out, he hopes that it shines for him. It looks very good right now, Phil. These are the ideal conditions for a man like Taffy, but it is going to be a very tactical race, I think as we get closer to the finish. Section number 20 now for the leading group of riders. This section is 1.6 kilometers in length, and it's a section called Vershan Mogre on the way to Kerenan. And again, taking up last position here, Bataliati, I'm not too sure he's feeling too happy on these cobblestones right now. Sector 20, 26 in total. Andrea Taffy, the winner of the race in 1999, now beginning to take a big interest at the head of the race because as they continue to race towards the forest of Arenberg, the strong names will want to be seen to be the first men into the forest. They certainly will on the far side in the pink jersey here. Well, switching sides there, Kai Hundemark. But Toliati not comfortable at all for Lizzie on these cobblestone sections. On the smooth sections of road, he is one of the strongest riders in this leading group. But once you start to lose contact with the men on the cobblestone section, that announces that it's not going to be too long before you're back in the main field. Well, here's the race situation at the moment. At three minutes and five seconds back to the two chasers, steals and clear. And the main field have slipped back to almost four minutes right now. This is Hervé. Also not uh, relaxed on these cobblestones, he bounces over them. But he's a man of the north, so he knows all about them and his name on everybody's lips here when they pick him up in the breakaway. That's uh, Nazon, the sprinter in the break. Good place to start with, the legs of Kai Hundert marked. And Nazon had a couple of wins this year, three in fact, but I don't think this will be on his list, but he's made the right move thus far. Well, a good start to the season for him, and it's very important for one or two of these small French teams. Jean de la Tour looking for a place in the Tour de France. Here's a problem at the back here for one of the Lamprey riders, and in fact, it's Bertogliati. He's having a hard time this afternoon. It looks to me as if he seems to be having a problem with his cleat there, Phil, because he's, he's moving his foot around all of the time. This gives you an idea of just how fast these men are charging over the cobblestones right now. Just look at Seigneur here. Captain of Jean de la Tour, former champion of France, both in the time trial and the road race. Current uh, time trial champion of France as well. And he really can show the newcomers in the break how to ride these cobblestones. He's causing a lot of pain here. I'm not too sure about Battagliati, whether he has a real problem or what, but he certainly hangs off the back of the breakaway to keep an eye on things. Calcaterra there on the far side, taking a break. This is the Allier de la Course, but it's at the back of the main field in the forward uh, group now, the forward bunch. 
Section 20 now for the main field here. Adamson on the back, the Swedish national champion for Team Coast. Just moving forward. This team uh, a little bit underprepared, I feel, Phil, right now, because obviously after their suspension, which kept them out of Milano San Remo and of course out of Paris Nice, very difficult for a lot of the riders to get racing competition. However, we are hearing reports from the circuit of the South that Jan Ulrich, having raced his first race in almost 18 months, is actually in pretty fine form. And one or two of his teammates admitting to us that they thought he was almost certainly going to be on the podium when the Tour de France goes to Paris at the end of the year. Oh, getting, these really are the Rabobanks driving the race at the moment with Sven Nice, Belgian rider. Always chosen for this race because he is such an ace at the cyclocross in the winter. So if nobody, anybody can ride the cobblestones, then Nice is your man. Again, a chance here just to see the chaos at the back end. 78 there, so that was Van Steens. There is Taffy moving forward as well. Number seven, Brian Tanking of uh, the Quick Step team as we rejoin the Tête de la Course, the front end of the bike race, and still a lot of energy being put into the success of this breakaway. This is Acosta at the back. Another crash we're hearing over race radio in the main field from behind. But this is the leading group of 11 riders who currently lead two chases. Tom Steele's and Andreas clear by 3 minutes and 37 seconds, while the main field for the moment field seem to be hovering at 4 minutes, not seemingly accelerating too much. Well, we're just hearing it, Mauro Garosa, the Vina Calderola side of Mac Ryder. He stopped with a problem, probably involved in that little shunt back there. As our camera's staying now with the head of the race here, Sector 20 of the cobblestone. Jean de la Tour's man from France, Eddie Seigneur. Free as a bird at the front and loves to ride the front. Look at the dust there caused by the cars now, just clipping the sides of the field. And that's rather a shame for the riders. We're looking at Hervé who does seem to have recovered somewhat, Paul. He's riding the cobbles a lot better now, look he, at him. He must have gone through a little bit of a bad patch just earlier on there. This is Nazan in the back in the red jersey for Brios La Boulangere, a team looking for selection in the Tour de France. Garcia Acosta, obviously not too comfortable on the cobblestone sections, but I think one of the stronger riders in this leading group of 11 for the moment. The top man, as we look at the back of the race, and I think he was obviously involved in a crash here. This is Cancellara trying to reintegrate the peloton. Maybe not quite as at home as we would have expected. He had nine wins last year, and he certainly is regarded as uh, one of the big Swiss hopefuls for the future. You bet your life, he's caught up the back wheel of Stefan Weingold here, the German rider on Gettelsteiner. So with a bit of luck, they'll work together and get back this time around on sector 20. Just uh, listening to race radio at the moment as we seem to be getting themselves one or two problems. But they're saying now that the gap call, three minutes 45 for the peloton. We've still got those three riders in between at 320. That's Claire and Steele's uh, primarily. This is the breakaway here. Garcia Acosta, the Spanish rider on the oh dear. This is the man I was saying just riding so well, Cedric Herve. The thing is about riding the cobblestone, once you lose your momentum, and I think he's got a flat tyre there, you can actually hear it banging on the cobblestone, so that's a bit of bad luck for oh. him. That's the, the difficult thing about Paris Bay in the wet weather, there are so many small flints, small stones out on the road, and for him, he's riding yes, on the rim right now, that is the team order on a day like this. You keep riding as long as you can until you get somebody in behind there to try and change the wheel for you, but that's a real serious bit of bad luck for that young man. Well, that puts us down to about eight of the original 14 in this breakaway at the minute, with Eddie Seigneur still on the top. 3.20 and 3.45 are the gaps at the moment. Well, the peloton are now hitting zone number 19 at the minute and holding, uh, holding the race at around about 3.45, while the leaders have now entered zone 18. And they've been strengthened now by the arrival of Capella. So he's got back, which means we now have nine men in front on zone 18. Well, zone number 18, 1.6 kilometres in length, Monstro sur Ecaillon, and it is a, a small, narrow section, and we see here Kai Hundemark coming up to the front end of the main field, and again we're hearing a crash at the back end of the main field. You know what, Phil, it's absolute chaos in the oh. main field today. Look at this, men all over the place.
Well, this is Paris Roubaix. Welcome to the race. As we're now seeing a number of riders in trouble, one of those riders there was Cerrone. Well, Cerrone was the teammate of Weinstein's, the man in the yellow jersey there for the new team, uh, Sedemak. Vinny Calderillo, you can see he was over on the right hand side. Complete and utter chaos, which is why it is so important to keep riding at the front end. It is a very nervous bike race today. All these men trying to make sure they keep out of trouble. This is the arrière de la course, the back end of the bike race right now. And uh, when you've gone down so many times, all it does is eats away at your advantage. It looked as though the leader of Fonac there, Denis Bertolini from Italy, was also delayed. Adamson, the Swedish champion, just as he was getting back on, he's now into the chase again. So, this race just reshaped. If you can hear the drums and all the noise over our microphone, it's because here at the Velodrome Roubaix, we're now being treated to an old-time uh, bicycle display, and the local band seems to be riding the bicycle, so it's... <laughs> Another oh crash, Phil. Another, Another crash, crash here now. Again, this is the same section of cobblestones we were looking at a few moments ago. This is section number 18, stuck at the back here. This is Chris Jenner, in fact, uh, the New Zealand rider for Credit Agricole. And Freddy the leader Gédon. of the Gédon. Française de Jeux, Guédon, the former Gédon. winner of the bike race, has gone down as well. Well, well uh, but we wouldn't have expected such multi pileups here in these conditions. These riders are fighting for every inch of the cobblestones today. Gaydon, the uh, last Frenchman to win this race back in 1997, is now in big trouble. Well, it just goes to show how attentive you have to be every moment of the way. A lot of times, races like Milano San Remo, you have to be attentive just at the Torchino, then at the Cipressa. But this race, you have to be attentive over every section of cobblestones right now. It is going to be a very nervous bike race because of the fact there are still an awful lot of riders still in with a chance of getting a win. You can see now the numbers of riders who are starting to get left behind because of these crashes. And what happens if you get involved in those crashes is you end up using an awful lot of nervous energy, just pulling yourself back into the bike race. Another man of standing left behind, Nico Ekut, also involved in that crash. But uh, Gaydon is off and running and starting to cut through the stragglers here in a big attempt to rejoin that breakaway. That's what happened on the cobbles too. The bottle is shaken out of the cage there of Bertolini. He might want that later. Punctured rider standing on the right of the road because of the crash. No service here. So he's going to have a huge chase as well. This is why you need so much luck and why you do your best not to lose front positioning. Well, I think the problem with Paris-Roubaix, Phil, is uh, a lot of riders have bad luck and the way to avoid bad luck is to ride in the first 15 to 20 places, but you have to be so strong to be able to do that. This again, a uh, chance to see what's happening at the back end of the main field. This is Robert Forster for Gerald Steiner. He too having a pretty hard time. Every time we go to the Arrière de la Course, we can see this man trying to just stay in contact with the main peloton. He's been caught out now by two successive crashes on the cobblestone sections, but you can be sure the big men are on the front end of the main field. Again, this looks like uh, Benoit Joachim. I think he's decided today he's going to sacrifice himself for Van Heeswijk and Ekimov, and who knows, the US Postal Service may well come up with a very fine performance. In fact, Joachim has done such a hard turn on the front, he's pulled away three or four riders. Well, good for him, he's shown terrific form this year. I think the best we've seen him ever ride for US Postal, former champion of Luxembourg, and is now trying to get a breakaway on the chase back. We've still got those front runners. Last time we saw them, they were nine in strength with Ludovic uh, Capella having rejoined after his flat tire, and good for him. The CSC rider, Bernesto, we're back up to the leader here of the big chase back, Frederic Gaydon, whether he gets back, He's got Jackie Duran to give him a handout, couldn't get a better man. And there's still a good chance they'll get Gaydon back in here. Heading up to the next sector of Pave, I think we're around 17. But in all honesty, I'm just going to wash at the minute. Sector 17 there, you can see Jan Kersipu in about fifth position there towards the front end of the main field. It'll be a hard chase there for Gaydon. But as you say, he's got a very good man alongside him in the form of Jackie Duran. That's the main field, and it really has been seriously reduced in numbers over the last couple of sections of cobblestones, and all of that really because of the crashes that have happened, and usually halfway down the field. There's a problem there on the left-hand side. I think somebody had a flat tyre. I thought I saw the shape of Andrea Tappy dropping back, and maybe he was looking for a teammate to try and change wheels with. 
This is the rear of the course, our camera bike working overtime here to try and get back up into the action, picking up riders who have punctured, crashed or simply been dropped on the cobblestones. The leaders are over Sector 17 at the moment. The breakaway, we think, is about nine men strong now. We haven't seen them for a little while. Capella getting back up there and driving on. This is Benoit Joachim. This is Joachim on the front. It looks as if Eric Zabel might have sneaked into second position. That's a pretty good move by him if he has done. And at the back of the group, there is a CSC rider, and I have a feeling that's Nicolas Jalabert. He'll be looking over his shoulder to see if there's going to be any return to the front end of the main field right now of Andrea Taffy. I have to say that that breakaway is holding their advantage at the moment. 3.15 is still at the time gap. There's Sergei Ivanov going through as well, a strong man. Into sector 17 now. Again, this sector, number 17, Aspera, a very long sector. 1.7 kilometres in length. Number 221 at the back here is... Eddie Seigneur for the first time deciding to take up a, a rear view of, of the, the main breakaway of the day in that group, Tony Cruz. A little further down the road here, Tom Steele's the Belgian national champion. He's about to get caught by the front end of the breakaway. And here you can see just coming through there is Joachim. And this is quite a good move. This is obviously what Tom Steele's was hoping for, to get caught by a small counter-attack like this. Wouters of Belgium, the, another former national champion in there as well as we go to the back end here, Phil, of the leading breakaway of the day. Sector 17 is where we are at the moment. And the chase group containing now Tom Steele's having come back to this group. Still not seen ending of Museu. The beautiful sunshine here, and we are being treated to a wonderful, wonderful Paris-Roubaix, a breakaway of some 14 riders setting the trend, hitting the first cobblestones. Now there are nine left up front, including Tony de Cruz of the US Postal Service team, and they're hanging on to a lead of around three minutes. But as we look at a chase group developing here, including Benoit Joachim of the US Postal, Tom Steele's the champion of Belgium, I can tell you that Frank Vandenbroek has in fact dropped out of the race. We're not sure whether he crashed, he dropped back from the peloton. There's been numerous crashes uh, so far. As we're looking now, one man in the breakaway here, Batagliati, who took the lead in a stage victory in last year's Tour de France. But this has been a great day. We're not that far away now from entry in to the Forest of Arnhem. This is sector 17 for the nine leaders, and there were 14 of them. Kai Hundertmark, part of this breakaway, and also uh, Garcia Acosta, the Spanish rider. Spain have never won Paris-Roubaix. And also in this breakaway, the man has been driving it, really, Eddie Seigneur of Jean de la Tour. Beautiful conditions. Spring has really hit France today. It's warm, and it's making for a very, very dusty Paris-Roubaix. And I think that, in many occasions, is worse than the pure mud of Paris-Roubaix. This is the front of the bike race, Tête de la Course, and a, yet another section of cobblestones. Bertoli Arti at the back here from Lamprey number 81 really seems to be having a hard time every time we hit the cobblestone section, but he is able to recuperate and get back up to the leading group of nine. I think US Postal this afternoon are having themselves a very good bike race at the moment. We're looking here at the leading group. This is Eddie Seigneur, David Bramati from Quickstep, in this leading group as well is Tony Cruz, which I think is a great performance by him. In the counter-attack behind, we've also got a man from the US Postal Service in the form of Benoit Joachim, and we've very often, Phil, seen the men who are riding well, Yatislav Ekimov and, of course, Max van Hazewijk. This is now Sexta 17 for the chase group. The breakaway have gone through here. The 1,700 metres of the Pave in 17. Well, this is Ivanov on the frontier in second position there. The Rabobank rider is Wouters. And as we look at the Arrière de la Course, the back end of the bike race, there are more and more riders being put under pressure now because every time we come to a section of cobblestones, and there are 26 sections of cobblestones to tackle on today's race, Paris-Roubaix, 
these riders are really getting dropped off one at a time this is one of the rides from Lotto Domo which is rather surprising to see they have got a rider in the counter attack at the moment Leif Hoster this race really is rather a complicated one and it's always complicated for the bike riders too there are nine men off the front at the moment chased by seven men and in the middle of nowhere it looks as if Tom Steeles has been picked up by the chasing group for the moment this is the leading group of riders on the road and they are being reduced quite dramatically. I think everybody now feels starting to get a little bit of an, a rush of adrenaline as they get closer and closer to the forest of Arenberg, which I think is one of the most dramatic sections of cobblestones, 2.4 kilometers in length and very, very difficult and dangerous. So one lone leader there trying to get away from the front of this group. They were nine. I can only see eight riders down there at the moment. And as we enter now, the end of 17 for the chase. Ah, oh, this looks as though we've lost the puncture victim, of course, Cedric Hervé, which will bring us down to the eight riders up front. Hervé fatting on the previous sector and about to be picked up by this elite chase group containing uh, Mark Routers, Nicolas Jalabert, Benoit Joachim, Tom Steeles. Still, we haven't seen anything at all today of Johan at Museo, and we know that Frank van der Broek has given up. So, 20 seconds off these pictures we should see, and there they are, the main field, what's left of it, trying to pick up the group containing uh, Tom Steeles. Yeah. Andrea Taffy in the main peloton at the moment, 181, uh, a very important bike race for him today. I asked him the other day if this was going to be the last Paris-Roubaix he rode. And like a lot of the older men in the main field, like Johan Museo and Taffy himself, they do not want to retire from the sport. So much do they love this bike race. 41, Frédéric Guédon, another former winner of Paris-Roubaix, Phil, after a, a very unfortunate crash, has managed to reintegrate the peloton. This we are going to witness right now is the chaos of the approach to the forest of Arenberg. It always is like this. The main field, which a few moments ago was about 150 riders, has certainly been reduced in numbers over the last few kilometers. Just 103 kilometers to go. We enter the forest of Arenberg. Just a little bit further down the road, about 10 kilometres away. This is Tom Steeles. This is the chase group, still running around at three minutes behind as they now go on to Pave sector number 16 at Avlui. And uh, let me give you the composition of the makeup of the chase group. It contains Sergei Ivanov of Russia, Leah Foster, Lotto, Dirk Reichel, Telecom, Mark Wouters, Rabobank, Nicolas Jalabert, CSC, Benoit Joachim of US Postal, Tom Steeles and all of the Lambeau credit, and Andreas Klaer, the winner of Gent Wavelgum, also of Telecom. They are chasing eight riders in the breakaway, and the last check we got, Paul, three minutes and five seconds. Well, they're still holding on to a very impressive advantage over the counter-attack and over the main field. The early morning breakaway of 14 riders build themselves a maximum advantage of four minutes, 45 seconds, but ever since then, there have been a lot of counter-attacks coming off the front end of the main field. We're on the 16th to go section of cobblestones at Havelui, 158 kilometers of, of today's race covered. And this section of cobblestones is 2.5 kilometers in length. When they leave this section, they've got around about eight kilometers of nice road before they then go into the forest of Arenberg. And that's when everybody will fight to try and go in in the first four or five places because that's where the race for me always does really begin. No question. That was the breakaway we saw with Damien Nazon in that red jersey sitting at the back of the group. Lodo is there for Lamprey, Vitaliati who keeps yo-yoing at the back, he's still there. Kai Hunter marked of Telecom. We have seen Johan Museo and Tom Boonen. Frank van der Broek, remember, is out of the race, uh, but Boonen and Museo are riding very close now to the front of the main chase peloton behind the eight immediate chasers of this breakaway. So it quite clearly, Museo is lining himself up for an attack in the forest of Arlenberg. 
He needs to watch out, I think, also for Andrea Taffy, who was looking pretty frisky at the front end of the main peloton a few moments ago. I think the big men like Museo and Andrea Taffy are looking to cause a rather surprise attack a long way out from Roubaix. We've had a very fast start to the race this out today. That started because of the fact we've had a very strong cross tailwind since we left the start in Compiègne this morning. And all of the time we've been up on some of the most fastest schedules recorded. Let's not forget as we look here at sector number 16 for the second group on the road here. 2.5 kilometers is the length of cobblestones here. Garcia Acosta at the back. Interesting to see the Spaniard has got himself into the early morning breakaway, which uh, built up a maximum lead of almost five minutes. But the big names, I think, now starting to move towards the front. This is Hundemark on the front. The right-hand side there is David Bramati, teammate of Johan Museo. And up there as well, let's not forget for Team Coast, that is Mate Urban. And uh, I think Team Coast are uh, riding exceptionally well, considering, Phil, they've had a lot of time out of top competition. Garcia da Costa here at the back. Getting all the dust in his face at the minute. You can see by the flags of France and Belgium. Tailwind on this sector of cobblestones. The last one before we race into the forest. Look at those skies. Perfect uh, conditions today. Some of the riders would prefer the slippery mud, perhaps. This is Leif Hoster in the chase group now with Mark Vouters on his back wheel. And Jalabert is in this group, but not, of course, Laurent, his brother Nicolas. Laurent now reporting this race for television on a motorbike and I wonder what he's thinking well I think he's having a pretty hard ride on the motorbike today because we're going over these cobblestones at some absolutely remarkable speeds the fastest ever Paris Bay was run off at 45 and a half kilometers an hour and that was done by a man by the name of Peter Post this however is Andrea Taffy followed by Max van Hazewijk Eric Zabel is up there, Johan Museo, the big names, Phil, are starting to come forward right now. Peter van Pietegem as well in the white jersey there. A little inconspicuous because he's riding as the leader of the, the World Cup competition. Joint leader with Paolo Bettini, Stuart O'Grady. The men are all riding to the front end of this bike race right now. And the one thing that Peter van Pietegem was worried about was not having too many teammates. But I'll tell you one thing, there are a lot of Lotto Domo riders still in this bike race. There are indeed, and remember Lotto's top sprinter, Robbie McEwen, not riding at this event, uh, staying out of it. And uh, he had a bit of a rough old ride in gemp Wevergum because he didn't make the front group in the end. There's Jan Kersipu going through. He had an attack earlier on, he was on his own on the cobblestones, but he had an unfortunate flat tyre. But at least he got back in to the head of the race. One of the riders, some Onsay there, and you don't see many of them in the race. But it looked like it was Xavier Florenco, Parencio. Well, again, we're looking at some serious moves at the back end of the main field right now. That was Stefan Kajagard in difficulty over the cobblestones. His objective's a little bit further down the season than in the month of July, looking after Lance Armstrong's attempt at getting a fifth win in the Tour. And excuse me, I'm coming by on the inside. There's the front end of the main peloton, though. Andrea Taffyfil is going from an awful long way out. Sean Yates told me yesterday Taffy is in absolutely superb condition. And he's showing he's a completely different man to last week in the Tour of Flanders. Taffy again driving over this long sector of Pave, sector 16. The one before the forest where the thousands of people await the arrival of the 101st Paris-Roubaix. Andrea Taffy, a winner of this race, now driving it on. Look at the view of northern France today. You'll never see a prettier picture, I don't believe. But the peloton heading for the forest and still require three minutes to get back into this race and the big guns look as though they're ready well taffy there look at the man in second position max van hazel it looks very comfortable over these cobblestones eric zabel don't discount him because he is a superb bike rider and it looks as if taffy was involved in an earlier crash you can see the shorts were just ripped away there is museo there is van pittigen moving forward there is tom boonen coming into sight now as well the big names coming forward even five or six kilometers before we get to the forest of Arenberg. They realize right now we're going through some of the most important sections of cobblestones before this race really unfolds. And it really is remarkable, Phil. The hammer has been down since the very start of the race, and we are still looking at 16 sections of cobblestones to go. Absolutely remarkable. It's a do a battle, is Paris Roubaix. You never know when life at the front is going to become life at the back. Stefan Jargard, the US postal there, still trying to keep the 
Paris Roubaix in his sights when they clear this long sector. 2.15 and they're now saying the gap so the race is closing in at the head as we race towards the forest of Orenburg. Taffy still driving the peloton but he's got big company here. Van Petergum, Museo to name but two. Well, I'm not so sure it's such a great move here by Andrea Taffy because what he's doing at the moment, Phil, he's absolutely isolating himself. He hasn't done that much damage. They've come out of section number 16, so only 15 sections of cobblestones to go to the finish in Roubaix, and we're still looking at over 100 kilometres of racing. There we are then, off sector 15. Next stop, the forest itself now. The charge goes on, that long line of bike riders there is no rest in this race now, no shelter. You may be in the peloton, but you are very much riding your own race. In the distance there, the old uh, cages that wind up the, uh, the old the winches rather, that wind up the cages from the pits, which are no longer in use. Uh, it's now become a museum, but that is the forest of Arenberg, and that's where we're going. Well, there's only one man claims to have uh, ridden over the top of the forest of Arenberg in Paris-Roubaix and worked in the mines underneath, and that was Jean Stablanski. These guys do not want to give up at all right now. The pressure on at the front end. You see the long line of riders, everybody scrambling to try and get a good advantage to go into the forest of Arenberg for what is going to be a very dramatic entrance. Days like this, the dust is all over the place. You can see attack coming after attack. We're about six kilometers now to the entrance of Arenberg, and still Eddie Seigneur at the front end of the bike race. Ted de la Course, this is the front end. Garcia Acosta, we're still looking at a leading group of nine riders right now, and they will have the advantage of riding first into the forest. Bramati in third position there. He will be very happy to get news, I'm sure, Phil, over the radio that both Tom Boonen and Johan Museo look exceptionally good at the front end of the main peloton. And they, apart from the loss of Frank van den Broeke earlier in the day, I think are still a fairly complete team. Bertogliati, he's had a hard time. He keeps uh, suffering every time we go over a cobblestone section. But he still manages to ride himself back into the group once we get onto the smooth roads. Well, this is still at the breakaway here. They're getting smaller, but these riders are holding off. A charging race behind them just now. Eight riders at round about two and a quarter minutes. This is uh, Vincenti Garcia Acosta of Ibanesto.com. He's a rare Spanish rider because he's in the lead at this stage of a Paris-Roubaix. And there are very few Spanish riders can confess to having done that. A bit of chance for art before we get into the forest of Arabo. We're looking back at the front end of the main field and the attacks are coming one after the other. One man I feel who is very frisky out there on the road, Phil, is Andrea Taffy. And that's remarkable when you bear in mind we're still looking at 100 kilometres to go to the finishing line here at the velodrome in Roubaix. And that's going to take these guys still around about two and a half hours of racing. There's plenty of fight left in these riders. They don't know exactly what lies ahead of them now. This is probably the most romantic one-day classic in the world cycling circuit and the, all of the riders may hate taking part, but they'd love to say they've won it. This is the head of the peloton, still in there. We have seen Peter Van Pietigum, Andrea Taffy, Johan Museu, Tom Bonin, some big names in there and still waiting for the pounce. We usually get the first big decision coming in the forest. That's where they start. In number 71, there's Gianluca Portolami who's listed amongst the men who could win today's race. But he better start thinking of moving away from the back of this pack because once he comes into the narrow section of the forest, there is the forest, he really has got to get off the back of the race. He certainly does. A quick glimpse at the back of that group as well. Nico Martin, the leader of Team Cofidis, as we rejoin the front end of the bike race. They are not more than one and a half kilometres away from the entrance into the forest right now. Here is Damien Nazon. Very shortly, Phil, the charge will begin. Vicente Garcia Acosta looking very comfortable at the front end of Paris-Roubaix, a man more suited to races like the Giro d'Italia, Vuelta a España, and, of course, the Tour de France. So the riders are heading for the Forest of Arenberg now. We've got about eight men up front as we head into sector number 15 in the cobblestones. We're looking here now at the breakaway, Tony Cruz sitting at the back. And the riding at the front, as he has been for so long, is uh, Eddie Senior and Kai Undertmarkt.
We are looking here at the breakaway. A breakaway which has thinned a little bit, but Togliatti yo-yoed all day since the cobbles begun. He's still riding at the back. Ahead now, the entrance pool to the forest. We can expect thousands of people here now cheering the remnants of the 14-man breakaway onto the cobbles. About two and a quarter minutes lead. A long section of cobblestones here, 166 kilometres covered. It's 2.4 kilometres in length. And what a great moment for Tony Cruz here as he charges into the forest of Arenberg at the front of the bike race. A completely different tactics today, I think, for the US Postal Service because they do not have Georgie Hincapie with them. This is the chaos which is the forest of Arenberg. Every bike rider really dreams of charging down here. On the front there is Damien Nazon. The pink jersey is Kai Hundertmark up there, David Bramati. This is the leading nine riders. They're about two minutes in front of the front end of the main peloton, which at the moment is being led by the quick step team of Johan Museu. Well, these are scenes that we've seen many, many years, but you never get failed to be moved by these wonderful scenes of a bike race going back over 100 years. The flags fly high, the forest is now barriered for safety. These are the eight leaders now as they crash over the cobblestones. But very soon, we're going to see the main peloton make a move as well. And look at Vincenti uh, Garcia Acosta, second here, Paul, as he comes through the forest. A fabulous ride for Spain in second position. This is Bert Togliati, the winner of the opening stage of the Tour de France last year. He has never once looked very comfortable on these cobbles. The man who's done a lot of work, 2-2-1 there, Eddie Seigneur, he's done a lot of work to the success of this breakaway right now. But this is always dramatic, the Forest of Arenberg, and it still gives me a chill down my spine when I see the pictures coming from this section of the bright race because this is where all of the history unfolds. You can see here Eddie Seigneur in difficulty at the back end of the main field. The big section of work done on the front was done by Damian Nazan, but great to see the Spaniard Vicente Garcia Acosta right on the front end of this bike race. In fact, he's taken up the pacemaking right now. This is great for Spain. Well, this is superb. Remember, no Spanish cyclist has ever won this event. He's taking them uh, uh, and driving them onto the grass here. As he now continues to make the pace, he's been a super bike rider, but we normally see him in breakaways on big stage races like the Tour de France. Malta Urban of Coast is the rider off to the left of our picture. We can't even see him anymore now as he comes up the side of the barriers. And the flag flying there, the Basque flag of Spain, couldn't choose a better flag right now. This is Mark Wouters, who is winner of the Tour of Luxembourg in the past and indeed the winner of the Tour of Great Britain. Well, this, this is the is second, second group, group on the yeah, road. Sorry, this yeah. is Mark Wouters. This is Sergei Ivanov up there. Leif Hoster in this group as well. Andreas Clear, the winner of Ghent Wavel game just four days ago, is in the group as well. And uh, I think it was also just tugging on the back there, still surviving the champion of Belgium, Tom Steels. They're only fill around about 20 seconds in front of the main field. And I'm sure when we see the main field charge in here, it will be blue and white and it will be the quick step team of the Lion of Flanders, Johan Museu, who's trying to win this bike race for a fourth time this is the main peloton now even the scottish flag was flying there the blue flag with the white cross there's museo that yellow helmet on number three tom bonham max van hayswick just in front of museo there goes van petergum he is fifth in line now they know this is the first decision time here now they must stay out of the melee behind them because at any moment they'll go down with a puncture or a touch of wheels Museo knows all about that. This is where he hurt his knee. So too, uh, Philippe Gaumont took it out for him two years ago. He's making his comeback only now. Dario Pieri looked like the man from Seiko on the front end of the main field, but Johan Museo was exceptionally comfortable. This is the front end of the bike race. The whole of Paris-Roubaix right now is stretched over the forest of Arenberg. There's a crash at the back. This is why you need to ride at the front end of the main field. Going down there very heavily was Bradley Wiggins, a, a former world champion on the track at the junior level of this sport. But I tell you what, that's why Johan Museo and all the big names, Phil, ride at the front at the forest of Arenberg because it is such a tough section of cobbles. Wiggins lands the hard way, but he looked OK. He'll get back up, he'll continue. As we now look at this group here, came in as group number two. There were eight of them, I count only five. Tom Steele is tagged on to the back. This is uh, Cal This is uh, Ivanov on the front here, followed by Leif Oster. Just behind him, we've got uh, Andreas Clear. Winner again, Wayne Mark Wouters. And Tom Steele just about hanging on. 
Fine pace making by the ex Russian champion here. Well, I tell you what, if you look in the dust behind there, you can almost see and smell the main field charging across. They are looking to try and pull this bike race all back together. There it looks like Benoit Joachim is keeping himself in contact for US Postal Service. Zigzagging across, that is her, that is Weinstein's in the yellow jersey there for the Sadomek team. Look at Musea though in second position, the yellow helmet with the blue and white jersey there, looking very comfortable. So too is Peter Van Pietigen. He's looking comfortable, yes, but this is not the Museo I expected here. I thought he would have driven harder, and I'm wondering if he's not quite on his best form. He's got, he's just using his brain here, using his tactical brain, and limiting his losses. There goes O'Grady, heading up the chase there from the remnants now of the peloton. One man we can't see here right now is Andrea Taffy, who was looking very good about five kilometers before the forest of Arenberg, but he's been caught up in the chaos right now. This is the long shot down the forest of Arenberg right now. The yellow helmet there is still that of Johan Museo. They're causing some damage, but I think we'll see a lot of riders pulling themselves back into this by race. Just off the back of the group there, Phil, is Tom Boonen in the blue and white jersey. Don't discount Tom Boonen, he was third in Paris-Roubaix last year, getting the chance today to ride for Johan Museo. Dario Pieri on the front here right now. Many people putting him down as a possible outsider for a victory here as well. A massive crowd in the forest of Orenberg as they watch the race come through now and the gap is coming down all of the time. This is Tom Boonen and he's not looking too comfortable as he now tries just to hang on at this sector. There is Taffy. Taffy hasn't lost that much ground, O'Grady working his way up, he's just shot off to the left of our picture, but there's still a lot of riders here making up ground. Well, just about three from the back there in the coffee dish jersey is uh, Philippe Gaumont, he would be happy to get himself through the forest of Arenberg because it was on this race a, a couple of years ago that he crashed and broke his leg. It still looks like a very large group here right now, Phil, as we come out of the forest of Arenberg right now. We're looking at 94 kilometers to go to the finish. This is the chaos behind right now, and it's good to see that for the moment all the big names came out of the forest of Arenberg safely and at the front end of the bike race. All of the men we expect to win are still in with a chance. Little Hervé there, the Credit Agricole rider, he was in the break, he's now out of it. And I'll tell you what, Batoliart has been dropped now, there's only six men up front. They are now out of the forest of Arenberg, 94 kilometres to go, and there is Van Pietigum, still in with a chance. And Petergum now checking over to see what damages have been caused yet again by the Forest of Arenberg. Looked like Tom Boonen shot through near his camera. And Petergum staring straight at Johan Museo. Heading up the charge here now as we say goodbye to the Forest is Andrea Taffy. This great man who won the race back in 1999. We thought was riding out his season this year, I'll be honest, just for the money. And uh, when I put that to him, he said, you must be joking, I've got great form. Well, it looks like he really has, because Taffy is now eliminating people with his fine riding. Here we are, an update. Two minutes to the chase group, which contains still Tom Steeles, Sergei Ivanov, and then the peloton just 40 seconds behind them, containing Taffy, Peter Van Pietigum, Johan Museo, Tom Bonan, and Stuart O'Grady. All favourites to win this year's 101st Paris-Roubaix. We look down what is now a beautiful, smooth stretch of road. It's the calm again before the storm. This is the lead group again now, what is left of them. And Tony Cruz is still there, straight at camera, looking straight at the viewers watching him on television. And he looks pretty good too. The other rider, Malta Erban of Gerolstein, of Team Coast, I beg your pardon, also looking now. These are the survivors of a 14-man breakaway and still they are holding on to a very respectable advantage. But the bad roads are still to come in this year's Paris-Roubaix. Pierre now looking over his shoulder. The group, Paul, just over two minutes and 40 seconds ahead of this bunch, and we've got those, uh, well, he's down, I think, now to six riders integrated, and there are a couple of minutes. It's good to see Stuart O'Grady in this group because I think Stuart O'Grady in absolutely fine form after third place last week in the Tour of Flanders. Frederic Guedon, a former winner of the bike race too, recovering from what has been a dramatic crash. That's the thing about Paris-Roubaix, Phil. At the end of the day, every bike rider who gets himself to the velodrome in Roubaix has a story to tell. This race is full of so many different stories of woe. This could be Roman Weinstein's here now, just tempting the riders to come out and play. It's one of his teammates, if not, as we're now waiting for the 
next sector of Pave at Wallers. That'll be a right turn off this road. And this is Bitoliati. Well, they said he'd gone, but it looks to me as though he's very much back in the fray here. Just on the wheel of Eddie Senya, who has also rejoined. Now, what's happening here? Cruz has got his hand up. I think he's got a flat tyre. Help on hand. He has indeed. Now, a quick change required. Otherwise, he'll be back in that chase group. Well, you can see he's not panicked at all there. He slowed down. He indicated with his hand to the neutral service motorbike there that it was a front wheel tyre that he needed to get changed. And very quickly, he's back on his way again. And I think uh, he'll probably get picked up by one of the chase groups because it's going to be pretty tough. He's having a little job getting going here. But rapidly into the fray, we hope. And let's hope he can get himself back up to the leading group. Under the Pont Gibus, as we continue on, which is a rather rickety old set of cobblestones, this, and it's quite long. Well, I'm amazed at the effort being made by this breakaway group, but they are managing to hold off everything the race is throwing at them just now. It just doesn't have the feeling of the morning breakaway. This group is still driving, and there's no strong men yet closing them down. Well, they've still got a very long way to go before they get caught because the impetus is still in this breakaway. Everybody prepared to come to the front and share the pacemaking. They have got the advantage of a mainly favourable tailwind since the start this morning from Compiègne. And looking here at uh, Tony Cruz, very unfortunate for him to get a front-wheel blowout on this section of cobblestones here at Wallers. Sector 14 now, as they continue to push on. This is Ludovic Capella, who got back to this group after an unfortunate puncture. Let's hope that uh, Tony Cruz can do the same. He looks very good today. With Capella, former national champion of Belgium, uh, now riding for the Landbau Credit team. In fact, one of his teammates uh, riding an exceptional race in the counter-attack behind Tom Steeles, the current champion of Belgium, who fighting his way back to the top of the sport after going uh, a little bit up and down. Uh, the first problem he had was mononucleosis, and ever since then he's had a, a serious problem just retaining the form. This is uh, the exit of the, for, the, the cobblestones of Wallace, and uh, you see how he just looks back over his shoulder there to see who's still in contact with the group. Well, Capella followed by Bramati off this uh, section, onto a good road at least for a short while, chance to grab a drink perhaps. Bramati must be wondering why Museo hasn't put in an appearance yet. He hasn't done a lot to keep this breakaway in the action. That's his plan. Garcia Acosta, uh, just off our picture to the right, had a wonderful ride to the forest. He rode like a demon as Kai Hundertmark now comes through here. The peloton. This is the group led by Andrea Taffy. In between somewhere is even off. Reichel, Wouters, Jalaber, etc. They still to pick them up. They were riding around about 40 seconds in front. It's so grippy at this part of the race. Everybody wants to go to the front end of the main field. They're going through there, the Pont Gibus you mentioned earlier. Gibus is the nickname of Gilbert Duclos La Salle, the Frenchman who won this bike race on two separate occasions. And I know you're always giving me a bit of stick, Phil, about how I used to ride over the cobbles, but I actually won a race over these cobblestones, a little race called the Grand Prix of Denain, which many of these riders will race in about three or four days' time. I remember it, Paul, like it was yesterday. Unfortunately, it was about 20 years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> it was almost 20 years ago, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for reminding me. You're a great bloke, really, despite what they say about you. I'm sorry, Paul, I admire you immensely, you know that. 35 seconds is the gap being given to us now, so they are closing in. They are certainly closing in. The pressure is on at the front end. An unbelievable amount of work being done by Andrea Taffy on the front end of the main field. But there are still a lot of quick-step riders here. And I think at the end of the day, that may well be what comes to play. Strength in numbers. We are looking down now at the peloton, closing in on the remnants of the leaders and in the leaders. I can tell you now that uh, Tony Cruz has had a flat tyre and he's still chasing to rejoin. This is the front of the main group now, led by Kai Undermarkt. As uh, Tony Cruz has not yet got back on, he got a third quick change, but he's in no man's land. I think, Paul, he might well be swept up now by the chase group. David Bramati trying to keep the gaps shut. Well, this group is certainly keeping up to a certain amount of their advantage over the main field. That was very unlucky for Tony Cruz. He was in that early morning breakaway. 
built up an advantage at one stage of almost five minutes. We've now come off the forest of uh, Arenberg through the cobblestones of Wallers, and in a couple of kilometres time we're going on to the next very long section of cobblestones, Ornain, which goes all the way to Wandigny. And I tell you one thing, that section of cobblestones, Phil, is 3.7 kilometres in length, so unless Tony Cruz comes back very rapidly right now, I think he's going to get picked up by the chase groups. Well, there's the list of names, and uh, Cruz may well do uh, best to just wait for that chase group now, in the chance that they are coming forward to this group, as we continue to course through the cobbled countryside of northern France. There it is, uh, the peloton picking up three of the chase group that was integrated, and I can't actually see who they are just now, but it looks as though Cruz might be there. I don't think that is Cruz just yet, but that is an awful large group of riders. That a lot of riders were left behind, but they seem to have recovered somewhat after the big attack there of the Forest of Arenberg. Taffy on the left-hand side there, looking very comfortable at the front end of the main field. A lot of Rabobank riders I did hear just a few moments ago on race radio. In fact, Jan Boven from Rabobank went down in what they call in French a chute sans gravité, a crash without too much of a problem. But I tell you what, any crash hurts. <laughs> And that's one thing that maybe the race referees don't realise. You bet you like, I saw a crash like that once and they put it out as Song Gravité and the rider came home and he looked like an Egyptian mummy. He was covered from head to toe in bandages, but at least he did finish the day. Well, just about a kilometre or so ago, this happened to Tony Cruz of US Postal in the breakaway virtually all day. A flat tyre for him. Fortunately, a motorcycle service was on hand, a good wheel change, and he's now in the chase. Now, Paul, the breakaway is still clear, Tony Cruz still chasing, the peloton seems to be regrouping. Well, I think after the, uh, the chaos of the Forest of Arenberg, one or two riders managing to reintegrate the group, but you can be certain there are still a lot of riders off the back end of this peloton at the moment. Not all of the team cars have managed to reintegrate the big line the convoy that looks after the riders in the peloton. Poor old Tony Cruz, he was a member of that early morning breakaway and I thought riding exceptionally well. He had a flat tyre at the unfortunate time. Here he is right now. He's caught in no man's land for the moment. If we could just have a look in front, we'd see how far he is off the group that he was with. And I would say he's hovering at around about the 30 second mark. Probably the most intelligent thing for him to do right now would be to sit up and wait for the main field. But this is great to see Tony Cruz. He was actually uh, appearing to be fairly optimistic about his chances yesterday when we spoke to him at the presentation of all the teams as we go back to the front group, which is now down to just uh, eight riders in strength at the back here. But totally after there, Phil, number 81, he is... Oh, there's a crash at the back of the group as well. This is a rider from US Postal who's gone down. It's Cruz. Well, it's how Cruz did that coming off on the corner. Do you remember the rider who fell here once and broke his collarbone? The same corner. Well, that's amazing the way he went down there. I have seen crashes on that corner before, and this is uh, quite amazing, you know. The fact of the thing is that we've got such a dry Paris-Roubaix, and there have been, it seems, a lot more crashes than there have been in the wet. Well, when your luck is down in Paris-Roubaix, it seems to only be compounded by other problems. A flat tyre, now a fall. And I really feel here as though uh, Tony Cruz is just keeping his pace steady. He knows the big chase is coming, and there's no point in committing suicide at this stage. We're on sector 13 now, and this is a long, nasty section of Parve here. Almost four kilometres, two and a half miles of, of stones. As Paula said, we've got eight riders left in the lead. Damien Nazon, Kai Hundertmark, Eddie Seigneur, Urban, uh, Garcia da Costa, Bertoliati, Capella and Bramati. Well, absolutely remarkable the way Tony Cruz went down there. It certainly, once your luck disappears, then all kinds of ills happen. We're now on the 13th to go section of Cobbles, Hornan to Wanjiny, and it is a very long section, Phil. This section here is just a, a section where you think you're coming off the cobblestones, but it's only for about 50 metres of decent road, and this is a long, difficult section. I think Tony Cruz will probably get picked up by the, the rest of the main field here right now, but I think because of the weather conditions today, we are seeing one of the largest crowds that Paris Roubaix has witnessed over the last few years. Just 50 miles to go, just 50 miles to go, goodness me. Uh, that is going to be one tough two hours of a bike race as the riders continue now to still keep control at the front. The breakaway was 14 strong, one by one, mostly with bad luck, they have been left behind. But Toliart, he still hangs on at the back. This man 
as elastic on his braces, I think, because he keeps coming back with a bang. And then he goes off again on the next sector of cobbles. Well, he really has done an incredible ride because he's lost 20 to 30 metres every time we go on to a section of cobblestones. And as long as he can stay in contact, he seems to be able to reintegrate the group once they get onto the smooth road. Again, it's Taffy on the attack, Phil. I really can't believe this man is attacking and attacking as he is doing because he's not doing very much damage at all at the moment. He said he was dreaming for a sunny Paris-Roubaix. Well, he's got his dream right now, and he's trying to blow the race to pieces as we charge onto this next section of cobblestones. 3.7 kilos kilometers two and a half miles of pain not such a big gap is it now everybody in between has been swept up we haven't seen tony cruz come back he's probably still in front but there's nobody else tom steels and the breakaway wiped out after the forest of arenberg and largely due to the hard riding by andrea taffy and i wonder if he senses something that we don't know here's tom steels now he's gone to the rear of the peloton and he's now hanging on i'm just thinking paul Taffy might sense that Museo is not riding as well as expected. Well, the only reason that Taffy will be doing that is to try and isolate Museo from the rest of his teammates because he knows the big advantage that the quick step team has is power in numbers towards the end of a race like this. This has always been the advantage of the quick step team. They've had a man to go out on the attack and four men to defend. And right now, the only way that Taffy can come up with the win, I would say, is to isolate men like Johan Museo and Peter van Pietergem and make it a one against one bottles flying off here the one thing you must always pay attention in a race like Paris-Roubaix is to squash down the bottle case so you've got to hold your bottle in nice and tight well Taffy is proving to be a giant of a man today as he rides at the front trying to destroy in fact the men who were once his teammates in this event here's the Oh, Battagliati, sorry, yes. Still yeah, I think, in fact, at the back of the group there, we were just getting over the race radio that uh, Yatislav Ekimov was having a mechanical problem. But Togliati, this time, Phil, losing a little bit more than the 20 metres he's lost so far, and he's going to have to do something very special to keep himself in the breakaway group right now because we have still got around about one and a half kilometres to go to get to the end of this cobblestone section. Well, this is a section that which uh, Paul Sherwin and myself and a few friends have often ridden over. It's uh, not that bad, this section of cobblestones, but they still give you a real shaking up. We're looking down here at the front end of the main peloton right now, and there's uh, a rider riding off the front end. It looks actually like the gangly shape of Rolf Aldag yeah, it does. rather than anybody else. Well, Aldag, which surprised us, has been tipped as a likely man to perform in the race. I don't know quite why they've chosen Aldag. If it is Aldag, maybe he's living up to what he read in this morning's papers, and it looks like it is. Well, he's a great bike rider. He's been around for an awful long... There's Tony Cruz just on the left-hand side there, being pulled back. back by the front end of the main peloton. Now, if he can recuperate from that little bit of bad luck, he may well be able to stay in what is starting to be a fraction of riders moving off the front end of the main peloton in that group i just caught a u.s postal service jersey and i would expect that to be max van hazevik because we did just hear a few moments ago that yatislav ekimov has had some problems at the back end of the group it is aldo but what a great move 34 years of age and uh, he won four races last year as well Aldag. he's been the national champion of germany he's had his bad times too he got hurt quite badly in the tour of germany a couple of years ago but maybe uh, the French newspaper Le Keep, who support this race to the hill, know something we don't because he was amongst the men they thought could put up a performance today. And it looks like they might be right. Well, the difficult thing about a team like Team Telecom is before the start of the Tour of Flanders, they had a serious man to look at the win here at uh, Paris-Roubaix, Stefan Weissemann. And in fact, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Phil, he came up with a pretty good performance here, Rolf Aldag. He finished in the top 20 and that is no mean performance. But on that occasion, he was working for Stefan Weissemann. The team now doesn't have a specified leader because of that crash of Weissemann last week. So men like Rolf Alder get a chance to ride their own free car. For some reason in Paris-Roubaix, and yet as far as we know, Eric is in there somewhere. We haven't spotted him, I must confess. Uh, but uh, they've got a little group split. Now, this is the split being caused by the chase of Rolf Aldag. That's a definite split in the peloton. Now, this will be the men who are paying attention down there. We'll try and get in as when we can get our motorbike into the thick of it. We might find out exactly who's got into that split. But that's a serious split here that Aldag has started something. 
It's a good move by Rolf Aldag. He certainly bolted out of the front here. It looks as if Andrea Taffy is the man who kept the pressure on, chasing him down. And look who's on his wheel. Thank you very much. The Lion of Flanders himself, Johan Museo, very attentive indeed. Next man there is Dario Pieri. A little bit further back, you can see Ronan Weinstein. He's in the yellow jersey there with a white cloth on his head at the moment. A little bit further back, you can see one or two other blue and white jerseys. Because of the vibrations here right now, it's difficult just to get a full identification. I think also we've got the, the leader of the World Cup in this group as well, the man by the name... Oh, and Tappy's going again, oh, Phil. Tappy is hurting them every chance, and he's even looking forward to see who's following now. There's the flag of the United States on the roadside, as an Italian leads the charge here. Andrea Taffy is riding super. Oh, down, there's a crash and another one. As they made the right hand turn, I think it's Kai Hundermarkt who's gone down. He's delayed Bataliati. Up oh, very quickly, though. It's Aldag, isn't it? I think that's Aldag who yes. went down there, and that was very unfortunate for him. There are a couple more riders from Team Telecom on the front end of that group. Let's have a look at it once more. He just slipped away. The speed of this bike race is unbelievable. And because of the dry conditions, even more riders have gone down in that same corner there. There's a rider gone down. I think that might be Tony Cruz who's gone down again. Ah. And somebody from Fasa Bortolo. So, as we watched... The riders here continue. That's certainly a crash, though. We think it's Tony Cruz, but this corner, amazingly, in these dry conditions, is collecting bike riders like you would not believe just now. Right, we're looking here now at the riders trying to get themselves back together in the what is the peloton being continually ripped apart by falls. Looks like... Uh Another move going off the front end of the main field again. It looked very much like Johan Museu. And this is the chasing group, the second group on the road. The acceleration initially came from Rolf Aldag, but after that it was taken up by Andrea Taffy. Taffy again, unbelievable. Taffy has launched another counter-attack. It cast in my mind back to when Andrea Taffy won this bike race. All he did was attack and attack and attack. Andrea Taffy has gone once again, this time shattered by Cervais Carnarvon, the man who himself uh, a victor of Paris-Roubaix, and we rejoin here the Arrière de la Course. At the back here, Chris Pierce at number 95. And uh, I tell you one thing, Phil, the pressure is seriously on in this main field right now, and the place not to be is in the last 15 places because you are just gasping to stay in contact of the wheel of the man in front of you. Up there briefly, that's uh, Federic Penner from the balance team, but this is Andrea Taffy now. This man starting to rip the race apart, an awful long way out from the finishing line today. Taffy on the attack, taking with him a couple of more riders just tucked in his slipstream there. Bit of a tight fit over the canal bridge. What a great move by Taffy today. He obviously wants to go for a long way out. We're now looking at the 12th section of cobblestones to go, Phil. It's an awful long one. Amazing ride by the Spanish rider, Paul. He just looks so good today. I reckon he's really enjoying this bike race. He's a great bike rider as well, Phil. We see him normally ride the big stage races, but here I think he will take one or two stories back to Spain about his conquest of the cobblestones in the north of France. Eight riders at the front of the race here right now. The man who is number eight in the group, as he has been every time we've hit the cobblestones, is the man there at the back, Bertogliati. We are now looking at a serious chase group starting to form behind Johan Museo is in that group. Great to see the South African rider Robbie Hunter's name popping up for the first time. I didn't see him yesterday when the team was presented, but he certainly is the kind of rider who could excel in conditions like these. Well, Bataliati refuses to go home. He's still there with the leading group, sits off, sees his own way over the cobblestones, closes it down when he comes off them. This is a stretch uh, of sector 12, 2,400 metres of rock and roll before the finishing line here. We're looking here now at the right of back, Raphael uh, Schweda had one good performance in his life, second in the World Cup Classic. And the other rider there is Serves Canavan. This is a very solid group sitting on the wheel here of Andrea Taffy. Taffy then driving on. Canavan, remember, 
a former winner, last Dutchman indeed to win this race. And Sueda, bit of a surprise, but is a man who can do a good ride. This, remember, is sector number 12 now. Now, what's happening here? I have a feeling Johan Museo just had an incident at the back of the group there because here he is getting back onto his machine at the back end of the group. Now, that is very unfortunate for the Lion of Flanders, but he will not lay down arms, this man. He is an unbelievable bike rider, Phil, one of the bravest bike riders around. He's got his teammate alongside there, Wilfred Kretchens, and I wouldn't be surprised to see another blue and white jersey of quick step moving back right now to try and pace him into the back end of the main peloton. Off the front end of the peloton right now, we have got an absolutely storming Andrea Taffy. And look at this. Take me to the front immediately. And Kretchens is pacing him by. These guys on the left-hand side are absolutely on the rivet. Museo wants to be at the front. Well, Museo had just about put himself into a group containing the South African Robbie Hunter. Obviously, he's had a bit of a problem. We're looking now at Taffy, Canavan and Raphael Schweder who are trying to bridge the gap up to the eight leaders of Nazan, Hundert, Mark, Senor, Urban, Garcia, Acosta, Battagliati, Capella and Bramati. That's the breakaway still, and they're the left, what's left of the original 14 today. And we are on sector 12 of all of the pave of 26 sectors, and this is a long one, 2,400 metres. Well, in fact, I put this down at 4.8 kilometres because it's two sections which are only separated by three or 400 metres of very good road. And what a long attack near now coming from Andrea Taffy. He's gone off the front of this bike race somewhere in that chaos there right now. There's another man oh, gone down there. The this ditch. Paris-Roubaix is all about crashes today. This is supposed to be superb weather conditions. It's a fast oh, no, it's a Francais de Jeu who's gone down. That may well be Frédéric Guédon. Well, if it is, that's his second crash of the day. And in fact, it happened so quickly, the race referees never even shouted it on race radio. Uh, they missed him off. Vainstein is in the frame on the left of our picture here as well, and Eisel. This is an amazing race today, and our cameras are right in amongst it. There's Vainstein there passing through as we continue to try and work out just about everybody and their positions in this race. Oh, Paul, lovely blue skies, but the riders aren't seeing. They're seeing blue and a few stars occasionally, I must say, as the riders continue now to try and regroup. We have eight men in the lead. Taffy is trying to uh, chase across the gap with Surveys Canavan. Well, there's a lot of chaos as we hit every section of cobblestones right now. The blue and white jerseys of Quickstep are looking back, Phil, all of the time to see if they can isolate the position of Johan Museo, who's been involved in a crash. Well, now we're going to see how he will fight back on this one as they now continue to open up the gaps and continue to come back as well by the look of it. We are looking at the moment of all of the men trying to repair the damage done so far after some four and a half hours of racing in Paris-Roubaix. But there are still 40 miles or so to come. Another rider just found a flat tyre there. The French flag and the British Union flag showing the crosswind momentarily as we course across section 12. Taffy was chasing with Canavan and Schweda, but they are growing and growing and growing. Philippe Gaumont was the rider from Cofferdis who just stopped on the cobblestones. And I think, Paul, Johan Museo has repaired the damage. Well, he's got himself back into this main peloton right now, but the damage is really being done by the counter-attack, which has got the big names in it. Men like Andrea Taffy, who's put some serious pressure on the front end of the main field. Here we are now with the counter-attack right now. This is Weinstein's on the front with the, the white cloth helmet over the top of him. Nico Martin is the cofidis rider in the group. In this group as well is Cerves Carnarvon, but I have to say, the man on the right-hand side in the red, white and blue jersey of CSC is the man who did most of the damage. Andrea Taffy, who is in absolutely storming form here this afternoon. I feel certain, Phil, that Johan Muzer would have been in this group if he hadn't had a badly timed crash. 
Well, as a lot of riders by the end of the day might say the same thing, we would have been there, but what if? Well, Weinstein's on the right here on his new team now, Vina Calderola, uh, Sidemac, trying to relive the, the halcyon days for him when he was third in Paris-Roubaix a couple of years ago. He's been giving us the impression in these early classics that he has been building, building, building his form, and I certainly think we should put him now amongst the men most likely to. He's got a great chance because he's got an unbelievable finish. He rode with the quick step team when he got his third place in Paris-Roubaix. Now he's riding as the leader of this new team, the team that has combined with Vinny Calderillo. This is the front end of the main field as we look at the Tête de la Course again. This is Ludovic Capella, the former champion of Belgium, who is going to ride off this section of cobblestones, the section of Tilloy on the way to Sars et Rosier, and then they will have a long 10 kilometer section fill on fairly smooth roads and that is when I would feel that the team of Quickstep need to pull the race back together and try and organize getting Johan Musier into the counter-attack with the big names who've st certainly gone off the front right now. Well, I have never seen Ludovic Cabell ride like this. He's been the national champion of Belgium. He's also had a runner-up spot in that last year. Not a bad way to try and defend your title. Uh, but this, without doubt, the finest ride he's had. Well, this is the third group on the road here right now. Ludovic Capella, the lone leader at the moment. The remnants of that break. Oh, somebody else has gone down into the gutter there. There are crashes all over the place here, Phil, right now. And it really is quite remarkable. The roads are dry. They should be safe. But men are taking unbelievable risks to stay in contact with all of these counterattacks. Left-hand turn right now. This is a long 10-kilometer straight road to Orshi. And this long section of cobblestones right now, this long section of good road right now, should give the men behind a chance to organize themselves before what is known as the Rue de l'Abattoir, the road that goes out of Orshi. That's a long, dangerous section, and it may well give Johan Museo a chance to pull himself into the bike race once again, because at the moment, he's stuck in the main peloton. Well, there's still a lot of time left to repair the damage here. 70 kilometers of racing, a little bit less, perhaps. And Ludovic Capella is the man now on the attack at 27 years of age. He's only won seven races in his life. He trade every one of them indeed for just one victory here in Paris-Roubaix because this is a moment is the best ride we've ever seen Ludovic do. There's still time to repair the damage though behind and the field still is coming together on Paris-Roubaix. This is the chase group. Well, this is a bit of bad news as well as we look at the chase group here. We're also hearing that uh, Nico Metan just had a mechanical incident at the back of the race and he didn't get himself a very quick change either. So this race today certainly is going to be a race all about bad luck that certain riders have had. A good move here by Schreber. Coming up in the red jersey there, Dario Pieri. The yellow jersey is that of the former world champion Ronan Weinstein's Peter van Pietigem in the white jersey as leader of uh, the Coupe du Monde, the World Cup. Great to see him riding so well, and uh, he could be writing himself into a little bit of history as well, Phil, if he was to win the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix in the same year. Looking down here, Paul, at the way this peloton has split, it's a long time since I can recall a Paris-Roubaix like this. There is what is left of the peloton. It was a huge peloton not that long ago. There are a lot of riders believing they have a real chance to win this event today. Well, I would expect this is the group that uh, Johan Museo has reintegrated. Look at this, Eric Sabel, number 11, the leader of the telecom team. He, too, has got a great chance here right now. There's Museo. He's caught up a little bit at the moment. Uh, he was uh, very quickly back onto his bike, paced back into the main peloton by his teammates, but he won't be too happy. He doesn't like to be in a situation like this. There is the leader of Ibanesto.com on the other side, Juan Flecker. Interesting to see he's decided to come up here to the north of France to ride this bike race as well. Quick step for the moment are still in a pretty good situation because Cervais Carnarvon is in the counter-attack. But I think if Museo wants to win this, he needs to organise his troops around him right now and try and pull this bike race back together. There's Carnarvon just gone through. The World Cup leader, Van Pietergum, Roman Vainstains. Once had a third two years ago and he's got great form and he'd be very pleased with the way this race is going. They're running towards the last 40 miles now of this event. There's the man that's caused most pain back in the peloton, Andrea Taffy, riding absolutely superbly today and looking like a likely winner. But he needs to save just a little bit because there are still a lot of riders here with some good legs.
But Phil, if you remember when Andrea Taffy won this bike race a couple of years ago, he was attacking incessantly, and eventually I think most of the guys just looked the other way because they just could not keep up with the attacks that he was launching at them, and eventually he took off with about 30 kilometres to go, and look at this, he's doing it again. It's amazing, but look, Van Pietergum here, just on the right in the World Cup leader's jersey, equal on points with the non-starting Paolo Bettini, who got injured in gent -Wevergum. He's hoping to come back for Liège, Bastion Liège, but he, there is even a question mark at the moment on that uh, for the luckless uh, Bettini. He has a shoulder dislocated. We're looking now, though, at the leader here, uh, Capella, and this rider, for the first time since I've known him as a racing cyclist, taking the race to them. Well, you know, he's the kind of rider who's certainly got a very big engine, a very talented bike rider. You don't win the Belgian National Championships for fun. And right now, I think I'd have to agree with you, he's putting in the best performance of his life. This is the remnants of the breakaway. I, uh, Kai Hundemark there on the far side. David Bramati will be very happy to be here for quick step. But what he'll be getting right now is some rather unfortunate news because Johan Museo is not in the counter-attack for the moment. His teammate, Cerves Carnarvon, is and for the last few moments we've not really heard very much about the position of Tom Boonen in this bike race. Just looking at the composition here of the chase group though. About 100 mark, Damien Nazon, last win for him was the opening stage of the Criterium International. But still riding very well is Urban of the uh, Team Coast. These are five chasers, we had 14 at the start of the day. Still Taffy working out how he can reach the chasers. This is the face of Roman's Veinsteins. He's had a third in Paris-Roubaix, but Taffy's had a first and a third. The breakaway, I think, riding with great intelligence just now. Nazon, recognised as a sprinter, doing just enough here to keep his features at the front of the race, and good luck to him right now. But the field is getting more and more ragged behind as Crash and Puncture is keeping everybody on their toes. Three wins this year for Damien Nazon. This is the leader, he's picked up his feed as well. Time to take on some food, he knows he's not going to hold the race off surely all the way, it would turn him into an overnight star. But he, right now, he is doing the ride of his life for uh, Ludovic Capella. Well, he's got around about five kilometres right now to go to the next section of cobblestones. Again, a very long and difficult section of cobblestones. It will be uh, 11 sections to go. It's a section of Orchy. It's divided into two sections. The first part called the Chemin des Prières. It finishes off with the Chemin des Abattoirs. So you go from prayers into the abattoir. So it's uh, not a very good fun ride for the uh, next four or five kilometres. I'm surprised to see him, Phil, trying to ride off the front of the group because the group, to me, seem to be riding very well together. There's just five men left in the chase group behind him and then a very serious group a little further down the road. Bramati here, I think, has obviously been given the word sit up and wait right now because we've got men coming across in the counter-attacks. Kai Hundemark was probably now know about the position of Eric Zabel. Nazon, Garcia Acosta and Urban are the other riders making up uh, the second group on the road here and they're at disadvantage for the moment, not very much more than about 25 seconds. Well, Erban is doing the ride of his young life there. What a career he might have if he can ride like this today. Still with the remnants of the early breakaway. Damien Nazon driving on here at the moment. Plenty of help at hand. Garcia Costa has been an absolute hero in that break as the chase group now passes through. Chasing and hoping to get back onto terms and have now succeeded in doing so with Capella. And I think that's a wise decision uh, by Ludovic Capella to reintegrate, to give us now six riders at the front. Well, that's the most sensible thing that he could do, I think, for riding in this long section in between those two cobblestone sections there. It's almost 10 kilometres the distance from uh, Tilua and uh, all the way to Orshi, and I think trying to ride that on your own is uh, almost a suicide effect. guys now, Phil, seem to have sat up a little bit. They obviously know that there's a very big counter-attack coming forwards, and uh, I think they've decided that the, the better part of Valor is to sit up and wait for reinforcements to come from the rear. The rear will very shortly, as we go through Orshi at 198 kilometres of today's bike race covered, they will now realise that men like Andrea Taffy are on the return for the moment. Hundemark decides to accelerate to come back up to the wheel 
of this acceleration from Nazon. And I think right now David Bramati will try and recover and recuperate for as long as he can. There you can see that's why they've sat up a, and spread out across the road because here is the counter-attack coming forward right now and a very large counter-attack. And I thought I actually heard the name of Maximilian Chandry mentioned in this counter-attack on the road. A man uh, Italian by, I suppose, Italian by belief but British by birth. Well, look, Van Pettigam and his group and there they are, are now only 20 seconds back of the breakaway. So the big chiefs are moving forward now. Erben is going to see the stars of his sport coming up alongside him. He's a young German rider, four years a pro, won four races all in Germany, and attacked by Weinsteins, wants to close the gap down and get it over with. Pretty smart move for a man very much regarded as a sprinter. He's decided to hit them just at the moment when it all comes back together. So he's gone off the front. It'll be interesting to see who organises the chase behind him very shortly. He's just catching the front group of the race pill. These are the guys who are the remainder of what was the early morning breakaway. It's six, but I think very shortly it's going to be one. Well, that was that shocked the group. Kai Hundermark has gone after him. So too is Nazom. I think they were a bit stunned there by the sudden return of somebody from the back group. Whether they were unaware that that group was coming that quickly, but Weinsteins is now in the front. There's the 20 seconds still to the group, which Weinsteins has left. Museo is in that other group, 55 seconds back. Well, this is changing as we watch this bike race at the moment. You can see it's almost all coming together at the front. That may well cause a slight delaying as they try to figure out who's in the group and figure out exactly what is happening behind. On the next section of cobblestones, if Johan Museo is in absolutely flying form today, Phil, I would expect to see the counter-attack coming from him to try and bridge the gap on the cobbles of Orshi. Again, a move coming here from Weinsteins, shadowed there by David Bramati. 60 kilometers, slightly more, still to go, 38 miles or so. And Vainstein's now riding like we've never seen him ride in this race before, although he's had a third place. Well, one man was leading Paris Bay. His name, uh, the former Belgian champion, but Ludovic Capella. He's now been swept up by the group he had left moments ago. And so he is now back in the field. And I can tell you straight away that a man has also tried to put in an attack here, Roman Vainstein. And here he goes now. Vainstein's clear with the rest of that breakaway tagging on to the back. And not far away is Van Pietergem with other big names like Andrea Taffy, but not Johan Museo trying to get on terms. Well, this is the second group on the road right now. Those guys at the front have caught the early morning breakaway, and we're swelling up to a group of about 15 at the front of the race right now. The second group on the road here right now contains Johan Museo and all of the other big favourites. They are around about 35 seconds behind the leaders, but there's an awful lot of attacking going on at the front end of the bike race. I feel if Johan Museo wants to win this bike race today for the fourth time, Phil, he's going to have to make a move on the cobbles of Orshi because he's the only man who's got the chance of riding across a gap like that. Stuart O'Grady is in this group, the Australian national champion, and let's not forget what we are looking at here is the second group on the road, and we're about a kilometre, well, these guys are less than a kilometre away from the right-hand turn, which will take them onto the two long sections of cobblestones, the cobblestones known as the cobblestones, the Chemin des Prières. So as we look at the riders entering the cobblestones of Orshi, a man who's got himself up here is Peter Van Pietergem. And Paul knows all about him. This is the field now as they come on to the sector, which leads us from the prayers to the slaughterhouse. And this is the area now where surely Van Pietergem will want to push on and get an advantage over Museo. Well, it'll be a real ride for Peter van Pietergem if he can win in the same year, the Ronde van Vlaanderen and, of course, the Hell of the North.
This is the leading group right now. They're into the Chemin des Prières, the road of prayers at the moment, and they're charging away. And it looks to me as if everybody from Belgium has come down here to see what they are hoping is going to be a very important win by Johan Museer, but it might get stolen today because Roman Weinsteinsville is in the form of his life. And in second place there, you can see Andrea Taffy. And that is Weinsteins on the front at the moment, driving this pace. And this is now the Avenue of Prayers, as I say, leading to the slaughterhouse, and it's Roman Weinsteins who is pulling this race along now. Van Pietigen in this front group, Museo, we think, around 30 seconds back. Well, Museo is caught in the main field and he may well find himself very much trapped in the main field at the moment. Surveys Canav and his teammate has crossed into this leading group. David Bramati is in this group for quick step as well, but I think the most important thing is the presence here of Roman Weinstein in the yellow jersey on the front. He is in absolutely superb form. Second position there is Andrea Taffy. A little bit further back is David Bramati. They're coming to the end now of the Chemin de Prières. They've got about 50 metres of very good road here, Phil. And then after that, it's onto the Chemin des Abattoirs, the road of the Slaughterhouse. In the past, there have been some pretty dramatic crashes here in the dry as well. On the back there is Andreas Clear, the winner of uh, Genwevelgem, and just behind him, Ludovic Capella, who was on the attack just a few moments ago. But this is the moment when Johan Museo has to ride himself back into this bike race, because otherwise, I have a feeling this very large group is going to start to move away. The inhabitants of northern France know all about this road, and they've come here to see if it's going to prove to be the area where Paris-Roubaix is won this year. Well, I think it won't be now. There's a lot of riders still in this action, but there's still a big group behind which contains Museo, could still happen. This is Capella, one moment dictating the pace, one moment at the back, and this is now Andrea Taffy who's driving on. Taffy is hitting them with every possible opportunity. Well, Taffy's really looked like the man on form this afternoon. Sean Yates did tell us that yesterday, but I found that hard to believe, having seen his performance last week in the Tour of Flanders when he was not the brilliant bike rider who won this race a couple of years ago. He Now there's Museo now, I think, coming out in the counter-attack as we look forward. He's tried to accelerate. He's leaving a lot of riders behind on his wheel there. It looks as if it might be one of the riders from US Postal. But Johan Museo now, Phil, knows he's got to try and ride across the gap and move off from the peloton. That is Max Van Hay I'm sure the way he's pedalling, that looks like Max van Heeswijk, who we thought he was in the group ahead of Museo. We'll check that out as soon as we can get back to that group. But we're now looking at the cobblestones here, known as the slaughterhouse section. And uh, thankfully, they are coming to the end. And there's still a lot of riders here trying to get on terms. This is Bert Roosems, who is now making the gap. The latest time check, Museo at 20 seconds behind. Well, this is what it looks at the back of the group, Phil, because they really are exploding off the back end of this main field. Andrea Taffy is in absolutely brilliant form here this afternoon. This is the front end of the bike race right now that we are looking at. The race is forming, I would say, in front of our very eyes, but Johan Museer will not give up at all. He wants to win this bike race for a fourth time. He wants to write his name up alongside that of Roger de Vlaming. This is the front end of the race. Number 202, Vicente Garcia Acosta, who's been in the breakaway since the early morning break, escaped and built themselves an advantage of five minutes over the main field. Kai Hundemark coming back into the fold after being left behind just a little bit there on the cobblestones. Van Pietigem now puts his head at the front of the bike race for the first time. There is Andrea Taffy. This is going to be a tough bike racer. Top left-hand corner there, you can see uh, one or two more riders making themselves uh, available for the early shower this afternoon. That was Tony Bracker from the Lambeau credit team taking advantage of the warm water. The best thing about Paris-Roubaix is to make sure you get in there early because there's not enough water for the finishers. <laughs> the men that do the hard work get the cold shower, that sounds like an unfair system to me. But my goodness me, they are doing hard work. On the left there, the man that won the fastest Paris-Roubaix, Peter Poss. And you know, it could be under threat today. Rolf Aldag driving at the front now. This race running over 20 minutes ahead of expected arrival. There has been no peace for the riders today since it started in Compiègne. These glorious weather conditions, a strong tailwind for much of the way, 
and plenty of attacking riding. This has been a superb addition. Well, this is a big group starting to form here right now. We've come off that very long section of cobblestones, 1.7 kilometres total. The cobblestones of Oshi in six kilometres time right now. Phil, they go on to a very long section at Oshi les Oshi. And that section is around about 2.6 kilometres long. We did hear from Race Radio that Johan Museo was around about 20 seconds behind. And if he goes into that section 20 seconds in arrears, he's probably the only man in the peloton who can bridge down that gap. Well, looking here, Frank Renier of the Brioche La Boulanger team. A new French team on the block and still privileged to be in a very strong position here in the main field which is still uh, riding along with Andre Kortha of Team Coast. Aldag is the man driving at the front of the main group. Van Pietigam is up there. There is nothing between the leaders and the chasers just now. This is possibly going to be the biggest peloton that we're going to see taking into the closing stages of Paris-Roubaix. What an amazing race it is. We're heading now for Oshi Les Oshi. And that'll take us to the last 56 kilometres. A lot of people's favourite, Van Pietigam, who said he's on form, tried to become the first man to win this race and couple it with the Tour of Flanders since 1977. There's another attack. Will he ever lie down? This man will not lie down this afternoon. Andrea Taffy does not care at all about the number of times he's going to attack. He knows this course to absolute perfection, and he knows if he keeps hitting them, Phil, one moment or another, they're just going to have to let him go. This is Andrea Taffy, who's just launched another searing attack with 56 kilometres to go from a group of 13 riders in the lead. Johan Museo has not yet come up. He's still in the peloton, a peloton which is huge and it has no means lost this race. Well, this group of riders we're looking at trying to get back into contention with Andrea Taffy is 13 riders strong. I was given the name over race radio of Stuart O'Grady being in this group, but I didn't see him in the national champion of Australia jersey. Taffy once again slowly but surely being dragged back by Peter van Pietigem there in the white jersey winner last week of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Up there as well, third position, David Bramati. The yellow jersey there is Roman Weinstein's. A move now coming off the front here. You can see the men from Team Telecom this afternoon certainly want to go out and do something rather special. At the back of the group here is Rolf Aldag. Here is composition. Carnarvon, Aldag, Hundemar, Pieri, Wouters, Weinstein's, Maximilian Chianri, Damien Nazon. And there we are being told that Stuart O'Grady is in this group. Well... You said before the start, Phil, you felt he was a man who had a very good chance of doing well in today's Paris-Roubaix. He's fired up, but I still remain confident, but there is Stuart O'Grady, surely in this chase group. He is not in the breakaway. So poor old Stewie is going to have to work something out. He's the white jersey down there, so that's... Um, and we forgive all mistakes on transmission of information on this race because, frankly, Paul, we can't keep up with it. It is changing every minute. We're now looking at a puncture here to Lorenzo Bernucci, the Italian at the back of the peloton. Well, this race is all about chaos, and even the bike riders have a hard time knowing exactly what's going on on a race like this because there are cars and bike riders, motorbikes, dust all over the place. It really is very difficult to see an exact picture of what is going on. Now, this is a long section of cobblestones, Phil. It's also known as Orchie. It's 2.6 kilometres. And excuse me, but the leader of the Coupe du Monde, the World Cup himself right now, has decided I do not want Johan Museo to come back into the foal right now. So Van Pietigem in control. Peter Van Pietigem, he's got the 2003 cobblestone already installed in the Museum of the Tour de Flanders in Oudenard. He's now looking to do the double here. This looks like it's Pieri attacking straight off the front driving it on this is an amazing race they just are going 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 somebody's gonna snap the elastic 
Well, they are hammering along today. This is Pieri. A lot of people tipped him as a big chance to try and win the bike race. Where's number 21 as the leader of Team Saeco? He's put everybody into difficulty right now. Look at the gap starting to appear in that group. It was a 13-man group just a few moments ago, and right now everybody's riding their own time trial on this section of cobbles. This is the 10th to go section of cobbles. Takes the riders from Oshilizorchi all the way down to Bercé. 2.6 kilometers. What a great ride by Pieri. Unbelievable, Paul. This is a rider took 11th two years ago in Paris Roubaix. One of the few Italians who's learned to conquer the hard roads of the north of France. And he is riding strongly now. As Paul has said, we've still nine more sectors of Pave. And there's a lot of men with fight still in. Lots of spirit back behind. A banner for Taffy just off to the right of our picture there. Well, they must have known how inspired he's been today. Well, he comes off that section of cobblestones, but you know what? That's only a brief respite right now, and very shortly he'll be back onto cobblestones again. A quick pass up there of the bottle from the team manager. You've got to be so organised in a bike race like this. Weinstein's here at the back. There's Nazon just in front of him. There are 12 riders right now chasing Dario Pieri, but he doesn't have that much of an advantage, does he? It's not very much more than 30 metres. At the front of the group behind there is Peter van Petegem. He too now will try and open up an advantage over Johan Museo, who is still trapped in the main field behind. So, looking at the gap here now, Pieri, as he dodges the concrete to find the best surface, and I don't blame him. Oh, well, this has been an amazing race. We're looking at Dario Pieri. And I think, Paul, that 13 group is now reduced to about six, so it's changing again. This race is changing every time we come to a section of cobblestones. We've still got an awful long way to go, Phil. We're going through this long section right now, the section known as Oshi Le de Bercé. With 53 kilometres to go to the finish, and it would be a remarkable ride by this man to survive off the front. It is down to five, six, seven riders chasing there as they go around the corner. Weinstein is still there. You can see one or two riders who have been shelled out at the back at the moment. And this race, in fact, there's a, the race is starting to come back together because there is the main field. I would expect to see Johan Museo if he is in fine form and looking to win this bike race riding across. But I think that is Museo there at the front end of the main field. He doesn't seem to have the big legs of the winner today. He's not dictating affairs like he has of old, that's for sure. And this is a most difficult race to judge which break is going to work. And there's been plenty of them. Dario Pieri here, fifth in Milan San Remo, this time around, just a couple of months ago in March. Well, not even a couple of months ago. And he's known second place in the Tour of Flanders. Was he upset then when he didn't win? And now he's driving the race away. Andrea Taffy just lying down in third wheel. Right behind him, the man who's established himself today as a danger is Roman Veinstein's. Well, what a bike race here this afternoon. There you can see Pieri. He's slowly but surely being dragged back by a three-man counter-attack for the moment. Very difficult to see from this height just exactly who is pulling themselves back. But I have a feeling it may well be Taffy and Van Pietigam in that group behind there. This is a brave move by this man, Phil. 52 kilometres to go to the finish. That's a long ride if you want to stay off the front end of this. Well, he has had such success over the years, Pieri, in this part of Europe. He has won the Grand Prix E3 in nearby Belgium. He's been second in the Tour of Flanders. He's also won a stage of the three days of the Panna on the northern coastline, which runs very close to France. Kersi Poo there, still dodging the cobblestones. Is he coming back or going forward? I'm not sure I know anymore. He's coming on to the back end of the main peloton. This is a great Paris-Roubaix this afternoon. All the confusion and excitement that this race always deserves. We're at the back end of the main peloton. Johan Museo still in this main field, and maybe now, Phil, at 37 years of age, he is getting towards the end of his chance of being the great big classics rider that he was throughout all of the 90s. 31 seconds back to the main field. You know, this race could still very much come back together. Eight leaders now. Pieri has given a bit of a break and he's tried and he's come back. Now there's eight men heading for Pave sector number nine. But looking at the face of Dario Pieri, he's been alone in the lead. He's now about to be joined by seven riders. 
but the whole race is thundering through northern France and it could all come back together again. We're looking now as we pass through uh, one of the panels there for the time to go, a uh, distance to go, but I couldn't quite read it. But the field is regrouping here at the front and Museo is leading up the chase just a few seconds back. Well, life in the showers is getting rather crowded up on the top left of our picture. It's become so important, we put a television camera in there now just to see who abandons the race before the leaders come in. Well, Phil here, Paris-Roubaix 2003. Peter van Pietigem already the winner of a round of the World Cup this year. He leads the World Cup competition. In fact, that's the white jersey. Andrea Taffy looking very good. I just caught a glimpse there of Sergei Ivanov in this leading group as well for the Fasa Bortolo team. So that's a return from I don't know where for him. There he is sitting on the back of the group. So that's quite a remarkable performance by that man. And all of the time riders clawing their way to the, fr to the front end of this bike race. Well, looking at the group now, 10 riders are coming together at the front of Paris Bay with 48 kilometers to go. And right on the front, Roman Veinstains, Peter van Pietigum, the World Cup holder. Pieri is back in this group. Taffy has come up to it. This is a wonderful breakaway. Former winner there, Serves Canavan, is also up here in the group. And so too is Ekimov of the US Postal Service. He is the man who's bridged the gap for them. What a remarkable race, but you can still talk of 50 riders winning this race. They're just behind. Well, look at that. Nine sections of cobblestones to go. This is a very difficult and famous section, the section of mont saint 213 kilometres covered, 1,000 metres of cobblestones, and the race, Phil, is still only separated by 30 seconds. Yes, we are looking at a 10-man lead group with some huge names in it, but the main field are really not very far behind. Number one, the winner of last year, the winner of three previous occasions at Paris-Roubaix, and he's not too far off the back right now, but I don't think he's in one of his greatest days, Phil. The only way he can win it right now is putting it down to some tactical manoeuvring towards the end of the race. Well, this is the chase group we are looking at at the moment on sector number nine. Now the helicopter ahead tells you where the leaders are, and there's not much in it, believe me. We are now looking at Peter van Pietigum, who's leading a 10-man charge. But I can tell you there's 30 riders at least now with Johan Museo on the same stretch of cobblestones. This is sector number nine, and this race is going to come back together, I'm sure. I think it very, very well may come back together. The front group now coming off the section at mont saint -Pervel, but what a bunch of names in that group there. Peter van Pietigum, David Bramati. Taffy, Weinsteins, they're all there for the moment. It really is quite a surprise as well to see Yatislav Ekimov. What a great bike rider, Phil. He's got such an incredible pedigree behind his name. World champion, world hour record holder, were Olympic gold medalist at the 1988 Olympic Games and, of course, at the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney. Watch out for Ekimov because if there's too much infighting goes on in this bike race right now, he could seriously take some good advantage from that. Well, there were so many names at the start today, but you could cut out perhaps five who everybody was talking about as the likely winner of this race. It's not proving to be. Van Pietigum is looking superb. Weinstein is looking superb. I can't say the same for Johan Musea. We've lost Frank van den Broek. He's abandoned the race. We haven't seen too much of Tom Bonin, and I think he's had it. I saw his face over the Forest of Arneberg, and I don't think it was to be his day today. The man who finished third last time out. Van Heeswijk has been in the frame, has gone from the frame. Instead, it's Ekimov who's come into the running now. He is a man who can run alone to the finish, given a shot. And what a result that would be. It would be absolutely remarkable. There is the group there that contains Johan Museo. They're still only separated by around about 30 seconds from the front end of the bike race. That's the front end of the bike race we're looking at. 
Andrea Taffy is the man who has done more damage, I think, than any other individual bike rider every time we've come to the cobblestone sections. But that's not what counts at the end of the day. What counts is finishing off this bike race. There are so many big names in that leading group. They're going to have to ride very hard indeed, Phil, to get rid of Peter Van Piet again because he is absolutely on song. Last year, the last time he won the Tour of Flanders, he went out for a big binge and had a really good night out. This year, he said he didn't go out at all. He, in fact, missed out on riding Gate Wavel game. So much did he want to concentrate on putting in a fine performance at Paris-Roubaix. The fastest ever Paris-Roubaix was Peter Post, an average speed of 45.129 kilometres an hour. He must be very close to breaking the record. These boys inside, uh, 48 kilometres from the finish, the way they're going right now, they've got just about one hour of racing to the stadium. And they're going to come into the stadium some 25 minutes ahead of expected time. They are flying today. They've given no quarter. They've fought the way to the front. They've fallen off. They've punctured. They've gone back to the back and they've fought back again. Andrea Taffy driving now in his breakaway we know has made at least two bicycle changes before he got to the first set of cobblestones and we think also in this front go group now is the former champion of Italy Daniello Nardello well Phil I've absolutely no idea where he came from he's one of those riders who must have ridden across the gap and that is quite remarkable a recovery by him his name has hardly been mentioned at all throughout this afternoon and that is a good move. Wouters is still here. Rolf Aldag is still here. These guys, for the moment, they need, now need to get themselves organised because that gap is still only 30 seconds to the main field. Wouters shouting across here, looking for some kind of information. And every time there is a pause or a slowing down in this front group, Andrea Taffy says, excuse me, I want to get off the front. Meanwhile, life in the showers is for the riders who have abandoned this incredible bike race. That's Sebastian Lang from Germany in the showers, and we really thought he might have had a pretty good finish in Roubaix, but at least he's won the race for the hot water. We're now looking down on Aldag, Rolf Aldag and Mark Wouters trying to snap the elastic of this front group, which is still about 10 riders strong. I'm no longer sure anymore. I can tell you, though, that uh, Johan Museo's group is now 50 seconds back. Well, Johan Museo not obviously in one of his great days, Phil, and let's not forget he's had so many comes, returns, I should say, returns to the sport after injury and accident that it really does play havoc with the body. This is Mark Wouters right now. He's had an excellent day here in Paris-Roubaix. He's been shadowed here by Rolf Aldag, another man who has given a, a serious number of stars as a possible outside winner at the bike race right now, but I'm sure that they're being chased down right now by Andrea Taffy. Taffy will not allow this kind of manoeuvring to take place at the moment. He certainly wants to try and win this bike race again. Well, this is amazing. A Belgian and a German rider here trying to go clear. And this hitting whenever they feel the pace is slowing down. It is an interesting concept altogether. This Sergei Ivanov sitting at the back just about hanging on to the tail of this express train. Vein stains in the yellow jersey. Three, three riders up looking superbly strong and same said too for Dario Pieri well they're just a second from the back is Daniele Nardello and a few moments ago he was not in this leading group but he rode across the gap with Max van Hazewijk Max van Hazewijk now looking a lot more seriously as a contender to possibly get onto the podium at the end of this bike race and if they do not get rid of him I think he will play havoc when it comes down to the sprint towards the end 55 seconds now is the gap to this group on the road this is the group that contains Johan Museo and I think Museo Phil is going to find himself very much trapped in the peloton for the rest of the afternoon because he's not the superb rider that he was a week ago in the Tour of Flanders. He was at the front on every occasion when he needed to be, and it was only with about 25 kilometres to go that he wasn't able to fire on all cylinders. If you're not on top form, if you're lacking just a little bit, then you're going to find no friends in that group. We're back onto the sector of cobbles now, number eight, I think this will be. Yes, it is, 700 metres of uh, cobbles here and we've got two riders trying to get away and it's been joined here now by Pieri. Well Pieri's come across there on this section of cobblestones known as uh, Merigny le Rue de la Rosse, 700 meters in length and look at the dust that is being kicked up into the riders faces right now and in fact the main field recuperating there it's the effort of Peter van Pietigen bringing it all back together 
Bramati having a pretty easy ride there, just sitting on the wheel of Van Pietigemme, while all of the time at the back of the group here, Sergei Ivanov is quite happy to be in this leading group, which is about 12 riders in strength right now. Twice the champion of Russia, Sergei Ivanov, pulling off a great ride here as we're looking to the tail of the group, which has swelled to around about 12 riders with three out front just now. And at 55 seconds, some 30 riders, uh, which contained primarily uh, Johan Museu. This has been a superb edition, 101 years, and we are still producing races like this. As we're looking out across the barren land here, give this another two months, and these fields will be bright green with the crops but right now. I think Musee will be green with envy at the fact that Van Pietigum is up there. What a great race, and we can still a long way to go. There is Van Pietigum, Paul. He's looking very cool. He's checking in by the look of it on his race radio there. Well, Van Pietigum is a man who would be very happy with this track finish because every year he takes part in the six days of Ghent, so he's not afraid at all of climbing up to the top of the banking. It's not a, a majorly important banking here on this bike race here at the finish in Roubaix but uh, one or two riders know that the sprint is a very deceptive one. 40 kilometres to go, that's 25 miles, and they should cover it with the speeds we've been travelling at today, Phil, in around about 50 minutes. Doesn't bear thinking about over these roads. Here he comes again, driving his bicycle across northern France is Andrea Taffy. And uh, driving is the word. Another man who's won the race, two winners here. Taffy's hand goes up. Whatever the problem is, that was Cervais Canavan there. Nardello also is asking for questions at the back of the race. There'll be a little bit of panic right now because Taffy is at the front calling for assistance and Quickstep is at the side. Well, this is what this bike race is all about. It's just keep, keeping calm and collected. Van Hazewijk, look at the dust all over his face. He must be feeling quite content right now. These riders relieved of the pressure of looking after George Hincapie as the gap starts to increase over the Group Museo. One minute and five seconds. I think right now, Phil, we're seeing the, the final face of the race starting to appear because those riders we're looking at right now, I think, moving into the role as leaders and probable winners of the bike race. This is the Museo group on the, uh, the chase at the moment, but I think much more now on the defensive because they are losing serious time. There's 20 riders here, and it contains also Stuart O'Grady. Here he comes through on the inside. And O'Grady might be thinking too. He's just missed out on the decisive move. In this group is also at Museo. They lost some 10 riders, though. There must be somebody putting the pressure on. Looks like it's going to be O'Grady. They've lost 10 riders on the last section of cobblestones. And again, riders calling for assistance from the back here. Roger Hammond. The British rider is riding again the ride of his life. Well, it's good to see Roger Hammond riding so well at the back end of this group, but, Phil, this race is very far from over. Seven sectors of cobblestones to go, and this is the charge of the light brigade. Here come the leaders, some 12 riders strong now as they enter this 1,400-metre section. 223 kilometres have now passed under those wheels. And Taffy is still there, three men back. Mark Wouters is also there. Peter Van Pietigum is driving. The men from Telecom, Aldag and Nardello sit here at the back. Well, it's a long section of cobbles, this Pont Thibault. It's around about 1,400 metres. Nardello is the man who came across the gap just a short moment ago with Max Van Hazewijk. Van Hazewijk, uh, three or four riders in front. US Postal Service have done a very good job today, Phil. They put two men into this leading breakaway. They've got Yatislav Ekimov and Max Van Hazewijk in the group of 12 riders. That's exactly the number of riders they wanted to get here. These were the protected riders at the start of today's race. So some seats. 66. Well, that might be his number indeed of Carsten Kroon, the Rabobank rider, who has abandoned the race and uh, he was a great rider in last year's at Giro d'Italia. Well, now he's also taking advantage of the early shower. These boys are still hard at work. Some of the finest professional cyclists in the world. In fact, some of the finest professional athletes, I think, would be a better term. Well, this is a serious group now. They're all probably sitting trying to plot exactly how they're going to unleash the attack that will give them the victory in today's Paris-Roubaix. And there's so many of the big names still in with a large group at the moment. And we're still looking, Phil, at around about 45 minutes of racing to go. 
There are 12 men in this leading group. It's over a minute and 10 seconds back to the group containing Johan Museo. And for the moment, it is very difficult to actually pick a winner from this leading group of 12. But I think pick a winner from 12, it'll be, Paul. I can't see Museo and O'Grady getting them back, but we've been treated to many surprises in Peru Bay, and this race might produce even more than we think. Surveys Canavan now. He's going to begin to think that here I am now once again. I'm elected leader of the Quick Step team. It happened once before when he was on Museo's squad. It became Canavan's race. And that was the only race he won all year, I think. It was the only race, but if you only win one race, you might as well win that one because it is a huge one. You see how he's decided to accelerate. He's being able now to pick the best and safest way along these cobblestones. They're off section number seven to go right now. He didn't do all that much damage. Even off moved up into third place. I would say Diario Pieri in the red jersey of Team Psycho there is looking very dangerous indeed. Van Hayswick is up into fourth. Peter van Pietigem, I would put down as the man to win if this group goes down together onto the velodrome in Roubaix. But, you know, I still feel this group will be reduced in numbers before we get to Roubaix's finish. Twelve very select men here. The World Cup holder still trying to make it. Two wins on, on the opposite weekends in the Tour de Flanders and Paris Roubaix. Van Pietigem drives on. He's still got an awful lot of riders to worry about yet. And they'll be starting to assess each other now to see who is going best. And Taffy has made no secret as to his strength over the whole day of Paris-Roubaix. Ekimov now in this group here. No George Hincapi to look after at all. So he can ride for himself or his new teammate, Maxi van Heeswijk. Here at the back is Daniela Nardello, our man of the Tour de France, who limped round once with his arm in plaster from a day two crash. Now showing us too, he's a great rider on the cobblestones here. So the race continues, still no indication as to the winner. There we have the break-up line-up here. Surveys can have an Aldag, Nardello, Pieri, Ivanov. Taffy Van Pietigum announcing themselves surely still as the favourites to win this race. What about Damien Nazon, Paul? Now there's a man who would take it out in the sprint. Well, that would be a great one for the French because he's got a good chance of taking out the win. He's a very good sprinter when it comes down. In fact, uh, the win uh, that he got earlier on this season was in a bunch sprint. Aldag, he wants to go for it too. This man is also on fire this afternoon. Chase there. There's a problem at the back for Van Pietigem. This is the leader of the World Cup, Phil, and I think he's got a back wheel problem right now, even though Museo is a minute 25 behind. This is bad news for Peter Van Pietigem. I think he may have a flat tyre. They've shouted for service, but they haven't indicated yet if he has a problem. We'll know soon. Well, we're looking at the breakaway here in Paris-Roubaix. 12 men are still clear. Ralph Aldeg is trying to push off the front. Pierre reacts. So too does Taffy Veinstein's. This is proving to be an elite group. I'll give you all of their names. Daniel Nardello, Serves Canavan, Dario Pieri, Vyacheslav Yekimov and Max van Heysen of US Postal, Romans Veinstein, Sergei Ivanov, Mark Wouters, World Cup leader, there he is, Peter van Pietigum, Rolf Aldag, Andrea Taffy and the French sprinter Damien Nazon. Well, everybody in this breakaway deserves 10 out of 10 for getting here. This has been a tough one to read. I think this race deserves 10 out of 10 as well. Now, this is very dangerous. The attack has come from Rolf Aldag. He has now been joined by Dario Pieri. Now, two men working together, I think, are going to start to open up a pretty serious advantage over the rest of the main field. Obviously, you can see Pieri has been out on the attack, testing the waters on one or two occasions. There are six more sections of cobblestones to go. I don't think the next one at 229 kilometres covered is all that difficult. It's only 500 metres in length. The big attacks and the big separation will almost certainly come of the cobblestone section at Cizouin. That's 1.4 kilometres in length. This is a pretty dangerous move right now. Every move has got to be dangerous right now. We're turning into the headwind. There's the flag to show us. As the helicopter flies high, it means most of the race will see exactly where these two riders are. Aldag has been superb today, absolutely superb. And as I say, a lot of people said he was a favourite to win, but we didn't know why. Well, he is a favourite to win. Meanwhile, back in the showers, the pain of Paris-Roubaix on the face of Rabobank riders 
coming into the showers and the legs cramped up from the cobblestones. As I've said so many times before, Phil, at the end of Paris-Roubaix, every bike rider who either goes to the showers early or finishes on the velodrome has a story to tell about this bike race. It is such a dramatic event. It looks to me very much as if that was the cyclocrossman Sven Nice who was coming in there, and that is a bit of bad luck for him because he certainly is a great bike handler on the cobblestones. Right now, though, the situation on the open road with about 40, well, I would say now 35 kilometers to go is Dario Pieri and Rolf Aldag. But you know what? They are not really opening up a gap because everybody in that group behind still knows they're in with a chance of the win. Gosh, I bet if we could get down there, we're going to see Taffy and Bab Petergum uh, doing the chasing back to these two riders. I think they're coming back as well. There's Rolf Aldag, totally committed normally rides in the service of Jan Ulrich or has in the past and currently in Eric Zabel now riding for himself Pieri a man of this part of the world even though he's Italian always rides well this is going to be a great finale now with still six sectors of cobblestones to come look at the gaps between the wheels they can't even organize the chase it's still every man riding for himself down there hoping that the wheel in front won't ride away from him well, I tell you what, that gap does not look all that big, but in fact it's being given to us over race radio. It's 15 seconds right now. They really need to organise themselves over the next few kilometres and looking further back down the road is the Lion of Flanders locked in the main peloton. All he can do right now is sit in this group, Phil, and follow them all the way to the finish because it's not going to be the great day. The Lion of Flanders, I think, will roar no more. But he won't give up because this man never gives up. He will still reach the finish in Roubaix even if he's not there celebrating alone on the track as he was one year ago and as he's done on three previous occasions. Johan Museo will not see his reputation tarnished today, I'll guarantee that. Well, 37 years of age and he's won all of the big bike races. He's one of the kings of the classics, I would have to say, over the last 10 or 15 years and right now locked in the main field. Thinking about what might have been, he crashed at the wrong time but if it'd been a huge day for Johan Museo Phil I think he could have ridden himself back into this bike race but right now two men are writing themselves into an advantage over the chasing group in the pink jersey Rolf Aldag of Team Telecom a man who's been a professional for many many years I think the first time we saw him was back in the days of the Tour du Pont Phil back in 1992 when he got himself a very fine stage victory there He's been a pro, I think, for about 13 years right now, turned pro back in 1991. He's now been joined by Dario Pieri. They have 15 seconds advantage over a group of 10 riders, which contains almost a who's who of the sport of professional cycling. And I'll tell you what, uh, Paul, his uh, star sign is Leo the Line. And this is not the line of Flanders. This is Ralph Aldeg who's setting the pace. The man has won 29 races. The windmill, by the way, is not being propelled by the considerable wind that's blowing today as we look down now, heading into sector number six. Six sectors to go at Le Moulin de Vatin, and that's the Moulin. Onto the cobblestones again, and here comes uh, Pieri, 500 metres of really rough riding now. And, and looks the gap to me, is opening, is it? It looks as if the gap is starting to appear here be between Dario Pieri and Rolf Dal Aldag. It's not very much right now, but it could well be enough. It's about 20 bicycle lengths at the moment. This is a short section of cobblestones at the Moulin de Vertin. It's 500 metres in length, but right now the gap and daylight has appeared between Dario Pieri and oh there's a crash in the back this Ivanov. is Ivanov has gone down and it looks as if it was Nazon as well he's oh on the oh. far side it looks Max I think that was Max van Heswick who went down there as well and it was Max's fault he went down first oh and that's a nasty fall by Ivanov Damian Nazon look at him riding well he's okay this is Nazon no this is Pieri back to Pieri now in the lead so oh. Ivanov and van Heswick the fall is there on sector number six which was only 500 meters long he could have taken him out of the breakaway. Pieri still pushing on. Well, I tell you what, that move there by Damian Nazon just goes to prove, Phil, why it's so important to ride a bit of cyclocross in the winter. Pieri still clear. Aldag surely will catch him back. Ivanov and Van Heswick, they've got a chase on their hands now. The rest are in between. This, everybody, is a Paris-Roubaix which will not lie down. And it's not finished yet, believe me. Pieri knows it just as much as I do. 
Phil, that's a very sensible move there by Dario Pieri. He looked over his shoulder and saw he only had a 20 or 30 meter advantage over Rolf Aldag, and he realizes we've still got an awful lot of bike riding to go before we get to the finish. So he, in fact, now, I would say, has decided to sit up and wait because we're still 31 kilometers to go to the finish. Better ride it as two than one. They need to try and build an advantage over the chasing group, but what chaos in that chasing group. I hope Max van Heeswijk can bounce back from that one. VDB painted on the road, but he'll have to wait another year. He's already in the showers. As we now look here at the riders trying to get back, I think, on the cobblestones. This is Sir Polini coming across. So he has a very upright position, a crosswind blowing. He wasn't in the original break, he was in the chasers. And Sir Polini now coming off cobblestones at sector number six. O'Grady there as well, position number three. He too is looking for the moment when he can ride across the gap. Don't forget, they're still a long way behind right now. That was US Postal Service coming forward, and it looks as if they've come up to Max Van Heeswijk. Yes, 191 Van Heeswijk. He's been caught there by Stuart O'Grady and Marco Serpellini. He has lost an awful lot of time there, Phil, because of that accident. Well, he's lost over a minute, in fact, but Sir Pellini and O'Grady are coming away, remember, from the Museo group, so there's a chance. There's another rider with them as well. I haven't picked him up yet as we look at the two leaders now. Aldag is back with Pieri. The tandem now, the Italian-German tandem. Now, the crash to Ivanov and Van Heeswijk may have shaken up that chase group. We still have, of course, back there, Van Pietergum and Andrea Taffy. Looks like Eric Zabel, I think he's just had a problem out on the road as well. There's uh, an awful lot of accidents happening to men right here. I think everybody is so on the rivet, Phil, from what has been a very difficult bike race here this afternoon. There is the main field. That will be Eric Zabel trying to pull himself back up to the group that a few moments ago was about 35 bike riders, and even this group now is down to not very many more than 15 men. 22 seconds now for Pierre in Aldag. That crash has disrupted the chasers. Beginning to look like a gap. Now we can see from the helicopter. Here we are. Back with the group. This is not the group, though, that was chasing. This is further back. This is the Museo group, I think, down here. Yep. But you know what, Phil? A few moments ago, this bike race looked like it was all completely over and decided that leading group of 12 riders looked like they were riding away where they went. But for the moment, it actually seems that they are starting to come back together. They're all separated by not very much more than a kilometre. As we look at the riders now, we are seeing the two leaders getting back together again, Pieri and Aldag. Last time check at 22 seconds on the left now, more riders in the changing room. Eric Zabel has just had a problem, he's rejoined Museo's group. Stuart O'Grady, Sir Pellini, Max Van Heeswijk are chasing still to try and catch up with the group which are riding behind these two. And you know, you can throw a blanket across the lot. The whole lot, 22 seconds down to the next group, but it's not much more than 20 seconds now behind that group to the group containing Johan Museo. Museo may well be making the master plan here this afternoon because this race is all very close together. Dario Pieri now is dreaming about the next section of cobblestones, which will appear, and it will appear after 235 kilometers of racing. It's a very long section. In fact, there's two sections really bunched together. The section at Cizouin and Borghella, it makes a distance of 1.4 kilometers, and they're pretty difficult cobblestones, those ones. Here we are, back to the chasers, Paul Van Pietergum there, still having to drive on, showing a little concern on his face. Taffy as well, Wouters just behind him. These are the remnants of the breakaway. Nardello is still here. Surveys Canaveral. Remember, we've lost even off. The gap we're now saying they're now saying has gone up by 10 seconds to 32 seconds. So they are riding away from this group. Now, did Sergei Ivanov get back in this group? It looks like he might be him on the back there, Paul. Well, he got Van back Heisling, very quickly. We know didn't. He got back very quickly. He's just there. Yatislav Ekimov is still in the group. Roman Weinstein's. It's 32 seconds, the deficit on the two leaders right now. I think that was a very sensible move by Dario Pieri. Look at the size of this man, a huge bike rider. Confirmation of the time gap. I think his dream of doing well in these one-day classics in the north of France came after his second place in the Tour of Flanders a couple of years ago and since then he's always felt that he had a great chance of riding well either at Flanders or in Paris-Roubaix. He's going to use Rolf Aldag now Phil to the absolute maximum he knows that the bigger advantage you can build over the chasing group the more chance he has of surviving to the velodrome. These two riders 
have got the first real shot at winning this incredible race. Pieri and Alzag, both of them have been on the attack as individuals as well as coming together in tandem. Riding the cobbles, it seems as though Pieri might edge the advantage here. And there's plenty of those still to come, five sectors indeed. There's Ralph Aldag, not shirking at all, willing to do all of the pacemaking. The crowd appreciating what they see. Two real survivors of a rough and ready Paris-Roubaix. Still chasing is Stuart O'Grady in a small group of riders now containing Vax, uh, Max van Heeswijk. Uh, although I think, Paul, they may have dropped Max van Heeswijk. He swang at 235 kilometres now. We're heading up towards the borders of Belgium here. Look how nervous Dario Pieri is getting right now, Phil, looking over his shoulder to see the position of the bike race. We're in the town of Siswang now. We're with the chase group, 34 seconds behind two leaders, Dario Pieri and Rolf Aldag. This group still being driven on. Ekimov is still here. He may not have seen his teammate Van Heeswijk crash, but he'll know now he's not with this group. Well, they're coming up to the next section of cobblestones, where that will leave them with just five sections of cobblestones to go, and the sector Pavé Gilbert Duclos Lassalle. Gilbert de Clarecel, the two-time winner of Paris-Roubaix, a great bike rider, and he certainly pounded his authority all over this bike race on this section just outside of Cizouin now. This section here has been dramatic over many, many years uh, as we go through the pano, indicating 25 kilometres to go. It was on this section of cobblestones, the dramatic images I remember of André Chamille leading the bike race, Johan Museu coming to 20 metres and then absolutely and utterly cracking. On that occasion, a disgusting weather all over the bike race, giving the advantage to Andre Schmiel, who got his win. And I can't remember what nationality he represented on that day. He was actually Russian at that time, Paul. He does move around a bit, I'll give you that. He's Belgian at the moment. I have to tell you that in Roubaix, blue skies, a wonderful crowd, totally mesmerised by what has been a spectacular uh, Paris-Roubaix today. 25 kilometres to go now for the chasers, led by the World Cup holder, Tour of Flanders winner, Peter van Pietergum. Andrea Tappi delivered many blows today, but he's still under control just as he sits on the wheel there of van Pietergum. It's van, van Pietergum, Veinsteins, Tappi, Ivanov, Canavan, Nardello, Wouters, Ekimov and Nazon in that group. Lost because of a crash is van Heeswijk, and he might be still coming up with O'Grady, Serpolini, and one other rider, but we're not sure at the moment. This is a very serious moment of cobblestones here, the cobblestones at Cizouin. You can see on the front there, Pieri, I think, accelerating again once more from Rolf Aldag. A big acceleration from the man in the red jersey of Saiko. He's again putting daylight fill between himself and Rolf Aldag. Aldag digging deeper there, off the cobblestones for a short moment of respite. And again, Pieri riding sensibly, just waiting for Aldag to rejoin. He knows with 26 kilometers to go, he need, still needs a bit of help if he wants to survive at this moment of Paris-Roubaix. There's still another section of cobblestones to come here. There are two sections joined very much together as we go back to the big attack here coming from Peter van Pietergem. Van Pietergem over the cobblestones and continuing to lead the charge here, only seconds behind that front group. We still have a very rough 400-metre section of cobblestones to follow almost immediately. This is back to group number three now. Sir Polini setting the pace. Van Heeswijk is here. And the man on our left, the champion of Australia, and that is Stuart O'Grady. And with him, too, is Jimmy Ongouvon. I don't know him, but he rides for the Brioche La Boulangerie. There he is. Well, there he is. Well, there's a big chance for Max van Heeswijk to try and recover after a pretty dramatic crash just a few moments ago. Let's pull back and see just where is the rest of the main field here in this bike race, Paris-Roubaix, this afternoon. There they are. You know, Phil, it is still all very close together. The line of Flanders is in this group, but I think today he's playing a defensive role, sitting at the back end of the main field. One other pre-race favourite who we haven't really heard very much about is Tom Boonen, the man who finished third in this bike race last year as well. He looked to be suffering in the forest, I think, so it is going to now uh, prove. Because also seeing here now is Damien Nazon in the O'Grady group, so we never saw how he was dropped, but he's been left by the leading group. Oh, he was balked in the crash, of course. Well, obviously, he never rejoined. Ekimov 
move by now in the second group on the road here. This man is a brilliant bike rider, a former world champion. And look at this, Phil, he's ridden away from the group. He is a great bike rider. He was put as an outsider for a great chance here today. And he has now seen the damage as Ekimov takes off in pursuit of Rolf Aldag and Dario Pieri. This man is one of the best bike riders in the world. And what a career he's had, Phil. It spans 20-something years. He's a world record holder at the one hour. He's a world champion. He's an Olympic champion on two occasions, once back in 1998, 1988 in Seoul, and then again at the Olympics in Sydney in the individual time trial. This man could be creating the huge surprise. And he has the form. Eighth last weekend in the Tour de Flanders. He is responding again and again, a former champion of Russia. And indeed, when it was the Soviet Union, he dominated that marvellously big country at the time. But now he's a purely a Russian and he is riding hard. 53 wins under his belt, not and, this year. And I tell you what, Phil, how many world records did he get on the track? He was absolutely superb at any distance you like. Thank you very much from four kilometres to one hour. Well, I have him down for 11 world records but I wouldn't be surprised if he added on one or two that I never did find out about. He's an incredible bike rider, and he's on his way, hopefully, to bring back the two leaders. Then we would have an Italian, a German, and a Russian cyclist in the lead, with, in my opinion, only seven other men now who can win this year's Paris-Roubaix. Well, looking at Dario Pieri, the sun getting higher in the sky, as the riders continue relentlessly now into the last 20 kilometres of a marvellous day of cycle racing. Whichever angle you look at, this is the angle that Yeki, uh, Vyacheslav Yekimav can see as we look over his shoulder up the road there of the two leaders. This is a man who is one of the greatest pursuiters in the world and he is doing what will might turn out to be the best 4,000 metres of his life because he's crossing the gap now to the two leaders with an incredible turn of speed. He once held the five kilometer world record in five minutes, 40.872 seconds. Well, in about four minutes, he'll be up with the two leaders and then we'll have three men out front and seven riders doing the chasing. This is a most remarkable race. I wonder if Pieri and Aldag know that uh, Slava is coming across the gap as we pull back now to what's left of that breakaway. There's seven riders in that breakaway. A bit further back, there is five more chasing, including uh, Stuart O'Grady. These are the two leaders, Pieri and Aldag. They have really ridden their hearts out today. And of course, they deserve to win Paris-Roubaix, but the man behind could have other ideas. Well, if Lance Armstrong is watching this on television, and I'm sure he is, He's going to be jumping out of his seat here because this is his mate, the man who he was delighted when he beat him into the bronze medal, Ulrich, and then this man got the gold in Sydney in the time trial. And the first man to congratulate him was Lance himself. So Ekimov is crossing the gap and he's absolutely flying across this gap. He knows that nobody now is holding back anything. They're all committed. Well, he's had absolutely no problems out on the course this afternoon, Phil, and look at this. What an absolutely superb position on the machine as well. The kind of position that we saw him proving to such great effect on the track over a long and illustrious career. And I think the best thing that happened to Yatislav Ekimov was having eight months off the sport because I think he really needed the psychological rest. I hope it doesn't catch on, Paul. We'll lose a lot of good bike riders during the season. They all decide to pack in. Mario Cipollini did that, didn't he? There they are, on the horizon, on the crowd line, Pieri Aldag. Here comes the Russian Express as he makes his way with the sun high in the sky. We're looking down now at a struggling Ralph Aldag on today's Paris-Roubaix, but he's come back yet again to Dario Pieri. Behind, just by 10 seconds and closing like an F-111, is Vyatislav Yekimov as he comes slowly but surely. And then 30 seconds back, the remnants of the breakaway. 
which will total some seven riders. Then we go back maybe another 20 seconds or so to Stuart O'Grady, Max Van Hayswick and a group of five. That is now Paris Roubaix. Well, this is the rest of the group on the road there. This is the group of the leader of the World Cup. Andrea Taffy is in this group, Peter Van Pietergem. But the man who has made the best tactical manoeuvre right now is Yatislav Ekimov. He has noticed there's an awful lot of marking going on between Taffy, Weinstein, Peter Van Pietergem, the big names in this group here, and he's decided he would take off alone. You know what? The stripes he's got on his jersey when we go back to see him indicate that he's a former champion of the world, and you don't get those for nothing. We're looking down at 20 kilometres to go now from the helicopter, 12 miles to the finish. As we head on to the next sector of Pave, I've lost count, I think it's sector number four now, as we go up towards that. Pieri has looked over his shoulder, he knows now, he's on his way. No point in trying to outride him, you may as well take a few deep breaths. Here they are, with 20, well, let's say for these three, 19 kilometres to go. We have three men in the lead. Nobody's got teammates to block for them, except, I suppose, Aldag, who's still got Nardello back there. But, frankly, they can't help anyway now. It's every man for himself. Ekimov, we were talking of another 37-year-old possibly winning the race today. Johan Museo, well, it might be this 37-year-old, uh, Ekimov. Well, here they are. This is the fourth section of cobblestones to go, Phil Confin en Pevel. This was the section of cobblestones which was bad for Georgie Hincapie about 12 months ago, and right now we're 1,800 metres of cobblestones, and this is a very long and hard section. It may well be that this could be the end of Rolf Aldag now, because I think if Yatislav Ekimov puts the hammer down completely and utterly, and he doesn't really seem quite decided to do so for the moment, Phil, I think he's more interested about the position of Dario Pieri. Surely a few deep breaths. Very wise move this by Aldag, because he's been under the pressure from Pieri. Now Pieri's become preoccupied with the arrival of Ekimov. Aldag just keeping control by riding the Pave at the front. Now that's a clever move by Rolf. Rolf's going to push on here, the latest time check, he's still pulling away. It's now 35 seconds back to the group containing Weinsteins, Van Pietigam, Taffy et al. And Aldag drives on. This is a very dangerous section of cobblestones. If you remember last year, Deep this was where on, eh? this is very. They've actually dig, deepened the ditches out quite a bit. This is where Georgie Hincapie went off the road and left poor old Tom Boonen to ride on his own. Aldag put under pressure again. It's a long, hard section of cobblestones. It drags up for an awful long time, and that I think may well prove to be the end here of Rolf Aldag. He is digging so deep into that body fill to try and find just a little bit more energy to stay in contact, but I don't think he's got it anymore. Dario Pieri has decided he's got to lift the pace and stay on the wheel, and this has popped. I think this is it now. Aldag has seen the end of the front group because we've still got more than 1.2 kilometres to go on these cobbles. They are very long and very hard. Shortly, they'll take a right-hand bend. It'll level off slightly, but I think the damage has been done. 1,800 metres of Hell of the North here. Aldag tried his best to control those two. He's lost the gap now, though, as we're now looking at the two leaders. Ekimov is showing, though, that he too can put the pace on. As Ekimov drives on here with Aldag and gone into the distance now is Aldag. Well, this is a very long section of cobblestones, 1.8 kilometres. They're on the flat apart right now, and before they come off the end of this section of cobblestones, Phil, I have a funny feeling. You can see the helicopter in the background. He's trying to have a look and see what the race situation is. Well, right now, the race situation is Yatislav Ekimov of US Postal Service and Russia is in the lead with Dario Pieri with about a 50-metre advantage over Rolf Aldag and still 35 seconds back to the next group on the road. This is a seriously oh. long section of cobbles, and Ekimov is flying. The 2001 Russian Cyclist of the Year, Vyatislav Yekimov, is the man now who seems to have the ability to match Dario Pieri, who must have thought this race was going his way, and then up came a tornado, and now he's having to sit behind him and just wait. This is Aldag, this is when it's difficult to referee this race, because Aldag is going backwards, and the chase behind is coming forwards. In this chase, and there it is, Van Pietergum, he's crossing the gap, it looks like it might be indeed. And Mark Wouters, I think. Wouters and Van Pietergum now. Two more Belgians coming forward. 
Oh, what a bike race, what a section of cobbles this section of Confort and Pivel is turning out to be right now. Peter Van Pietingham has decided he wants to cross the gap for the moment. He wants to make himself a little piece of history. He isn't scared of any of those motorbikes. Get out of the way, I can use you as much as I want. Thank you very much. Mark Wouters getting onto the wheel there of the leader of the World Cup. Right in their sights now, they can see Rolf Aldag. And 20 seconds up the road are the two-man chase, the two-man attackers. Weinsteins is coming back as well. Oh, this race is going to be something special. In a couple of kilometres time, Phil, we've got the very long and difficult section of the Carrefour de l'Arbre. I tell you what, this bike race could still come back together. Well, let's hope the others don't hear you, Paul, because for these riders, surely this race has been hard enough now as Weinsteins gets himself into the frame now. We've got Ekimor Pieri up front. We've got Aldag coming back rapidly to these three here. Wouters, Van Pietigam and Vainsteins. Just from where will the winner come today? Well, I thought it was going to be Ekimov or Pieri. And look at this. This is Nardello riding himself back into the bike race, Phil. In about a kilometre's time, we're going to go on to the Carrefour de l'Arb. So this really is... This is it. This is the next section of cobblestones. Three to go right now. Three cobblestones to go, or three sections of cobblestones, and this is a vicious 2,100 metres as they drive on. This is sector three. Here in Paris-Roubaix, we are now on the third from the end as far as the cobblestones go, but they don't get any easier. This is 2,100 metres now. They have just caught, and it's followed, by the way, very quickly by another kilometre. We've just caught Ralph Aldag, still in front, Vyatislav Yekimov for US Postal, and a Pieri of the Seiko team. Wouters, Van Pietigam and Vainsteins lost in the mist, but coming. Well, Yatislav Ekimov is absolutely storming here right now. He's on the Pave de l'Arbre. This is a very difficult section. He's on the flattest part right now. In a few moments' time, he'll take a, a left-hand turn. It will start to climb up. He is putting a bit of air between himself and Dario Pieri. I don't think Pieri is weakening right now. He's maybe just backed off a little bit so he can follow his own line over the cobblestones. He does not want a mechanical incident at the moment. Ekimov flicking into the centre of the cobblestones right now, looking for the smoothest line over this Pave de l'Arbre. This is such a long section of cobblestones, Phil. It might only be 2.1 kilometres here. They've got about 50 metres of smooth road, and then again, the long section, 1.1 kilometres of Gruzon. Ekimov is throwing everything at this bike right, race right now, but you know what? I have a feeling Pierre is recovering, but so is this man. Peter van Pietigen, the leader of the World Cup and the winner seven days ago of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Look at the face on Peter van Pietigen. A man who's tried to become the first rider since 1977 and Roger de Vlaming to win this uh, race back-to-back -back with the Tour of Flanders. And I take my hat off to Dario Pieri because he gritted his teeth as well and he's clawed his way back to Vyatislav Yekimov. You must remember too that Yekimov in 1995 finished fourth in this race, so it's no big surprise. The only surprise is he hasn't won a race, uh, well, nearly two years, Paul. Back in 2001, it was at the end of the season that he got himself a victory, and even that was only a small criterium in Luxembourg, and that was supposed to be the end of his career. But since then, he's had eight months out of the sport and come back. There is Peter van Pietigem, Phil, and he is almost onto the tail of those two men who've set this race on fire for the last 15 kilometres since Cizouin. Peter van Pietigem is looking at the red jersey there of Dario Pieri. This man is doing an absolutely fantastic ride for the moment, and I can see this is going to be a great match when we come down to the velodrome, because if Yatislav Ekimov and Peter van Pietigem try and sprint it out on the track together, you are looking at two very serious track riders. Again, Ekimov accelerates. He puts time between himself and Dario Pieri. It might only be a few metres, but sometimes psychologically that's all it takes. Three men now in the space of 10 seconds here at Paris-Roubaix. 37 years of age, he flies under the Breton flag. And now Yekimov is trying to deliver the killer blow. When Pieri thought he calmed him and when Van Pietigam thought he was catching him, he's found yet another piece of acceleration. 
This is the man who once won a stage of the Tour de France. I think it was into Macon Paul when he rode off the front of a fast sprinting bunch to win the stage alone, all on pure speed. Absolutely superb. We very often talk about men who can slip out of a main peloton in the last five kilometres. Well, there are not very many names that you can conjure up able to do something like that, but this is one of them. Yatislav Ekimov has got about 40 metres advantage right now. The fact is that the race has changed. Look at the speed he's going around these corners, Phil. It was Macon back in 1991. He slipped away from the main field over the last 5,000 metres. This is not, uh, well, this is a puncture for Andrea Taffy. Crevaison at the back end of the bike race, so he's not having an awfully great day. Peter Van Pietigam is, though, in the white jersey. He's trying to claw his way back to Yatislav Ekimov. And one man, I would think, will take a sheer amount of pleasure from seeing Yatislav Ekimov win Paris-Roubaix, and that's a man who's won the Tour de France for the last four years, his own teammate, Lance Armstrong. The speed over these cobblestones right now, Phil, is absolutely unbelievable. We are looking at about 50 kilometres an hour. Look at the face here on Peter Van Pietigam. He's not more than 10 metres behind. He's nine metres behind. He's closing in onto the slipstream of Ekimov. The leader of the World Cup, the winner of Tour of Flanders last year, has rejoined Ekimov. Two men lead the bike race. Absolutely superb. What a finale this is. Now, Van Pietigam, the man who packs the sprint all of a sudden. Advantage swings towards Belgium. What a lead this would give Peter in the World Cup with 100 points on the line, and his challenge is not with him today. In fact, going second could well be Vyatislav Yekimov. Once a pursuit world champion, Vyatislav Yegimov has now been caught by a Belgian sprinter. This is the puncture, I think, to Taffy. This is the this problem is Taffy had. This was just a little bit. This was at the end of the Pave de l'Arbre, and that was a lot of bad luck for Andrea Taffy. Now then, let's see what these two men are going to do. Don't forget, not too far behind them is Dario Pieri, but two leaders at Paris-Roubaix right now. We're at 12 and a half kilometres to go. Ekimov is going to have to think this one out very carefully because the best bike race in the Classic so far this season is the man in the white jersey at the front, Peter Van Pietigem. We still do not know the winner of this year's Paris-Roubaix in a race that has changed and about changed by the minute. And here comes Pieri. Pieri has not given up. He's off the cobbles and he's driving on. And this will confuse the issue even more. We are very soon going to have three men back at the front of this extraordinary bike race where every pro cyclist has committed himself. This is a special edition. Here comes Pieri now, Paul. He'll make it three men at the front. The sprint surely will favour Van Pietigam, and they know it. They'll have to get rid of him. Well, the big problem is, I think, the fact that there are three men right now is actually going to make it rather complicated for Van Pietigam because they do know he's the man of form. Here is Johan Museu, and uh, this is at the top of the Pave de l'Arbre. And I think uh, we're looking at uh, possibly the last time Johan Museo will ride this great bike race. Congratulations from Van Aesweek. Well, we are looking here as we enter Sector 3. Johan Museo, the Lion of Flanders, three times a winner of this great race. He's now riding along to the applause of the crowd here. And just in front of him, Max van Heeswijk, the rider who crashed a few sectors of Pavi ago. They are now riding to the finish of Paris-Roubaix, while up ahead, three riders are fighting out what is indeed a $30,000 first prize. Here they are, and if they come onto the track together, well, I'd, I'd say the roof will be lifted off the stadium, but we haven't got one. Well, no, we haven't got a stadium, but it will be a very large reception for these men. Pierre here coming up to Yatislav Ekimov. And I would have to say that uh, the man on the front in the white jersey, leader of the World Cup, Peter Van Pietigem, will not be too excited about having a three-man situation. He probably would feel that he would be the fastest man in a two-up sprint against Yatislav Ekimov, but I am sure these two men are going to try and outmaneuver him on the run in towards the finish line. And if you give Ekimov 40 or 50 metres advantage going onto a track like this, well, he'd probably think he's back at the World Championships or the Olympic Games back in 1988. And how proud is Van Pietigam, the World Cup leader? This is round number three in the World Cup. He's got the jersey and he's right here on the decisive final move. Well, his wife's going to go beside herself now, Angelique, when she's watching this on television. She was in tears as he came to the finish of the Tour de Flanders, and he won that. 
Well, I think she'd be getting pretty excited right now, and she must certainly not be too far away from here. I'd actually like to have a look and see if I can see Peter Van Pietergem's father-in-law, because he had said if Van Pietergem won the Ronde van Vlaanderen, he was going to shave no. off his handlebar moustache. No, that would be terrible. He has this wonderful moustache. <laughs> if he loses that, we'll never recognise him again. Well, that's all in the future, of course, because right now, as we come down towards 10 kilometres to go, we have a Belgian cyclist, a Russian cyclist, and an Italian. This is the town of Gruzon right now, and in a couple of kilometres' time, they'll face the last real section of cobblestones in this year's Paris-Roubaix. It started off at Compiègne this morning at 11 o'clock, and they've faced 26 sections of cobblestones. Only two remain, but I would have to say only one really is a serious one. The cobblestone section at M, 1,400 metres in length, because the last section is really just outside the stadium here, and that's only 300 metres long. Peter van Pietergem has ridden this race to absolute perfection right now, Phil. He's watched and controlled and moved across the gaps when he needed to. The three men at the moment, they still can't uh, mess about too much because there is a group behind them which is starting to reform. And I tell you one thing, it's still only 35 seconds, so they need to make sure they keep collaborating. These are the boys of Paris-Roubaix. A second place is the best finish by van Pietergem. A fourth place, the best finish by Ekimov and 11th place by Dario Pieri. But they've all been to the stadium. They all know the welcome they will receive when they come into the stadium. The last 750 metres, you may not even hear us commentate. Well, I'll tell you one thing as well. One team that is seriously lost out right now is the Quick Step team. The super favourites before the start of the race. Their best rider is Cerves Canavan, who at the moment is around about 50 seconds behind this leading group. They're now leaving the small town of Chiron, and very shortly they will get on to the final serious section of cobblestones, the section known as M. And at the end of that section, Phil, I've got to tell you one thing. There's a rather strange monument to Henny Kuiper. 9.36 kilometres to the finish for the three men. And I don't think anybody will reach them now, but you never know. We are now looking at the three best men of Paris-Roubaix. Which one will win? If I have my way, I'd give the first prize to all three. Ekimov, who came up to Pieri. Van Pietergem, who came up to Pieri and went up to Ekimov. They are the three leaders. Looking down on Daniel Nardello here and Mark Wouters. They are 30 seconds back. Just off the camera, now on it, is Roman Veinstein's, and I think Aldag is still tagged on the tail. Well, 49 seconds, just about 19 seconds behind these guys is Serves Canavan and Sergei Ivanov as well. This bike race has certainly been one of the most dramatic Paris-Roubaix we've seen in the latest years. And despite the fact that I know a lot of the photographers out on the course dream for a wet Paris-Roubaix, well, I tell you what, this one has been a fair humdinger this afternoon. Serves Canavan is 49 seconds back. He's the best place rider, Phil, of the super dominant quick step team. They have literally fallen to pieces today. Well, it started when Vanderbroek packed it all in. Then there was others involved in crashes like Kretzkin, the good pacemaker, lost very early on, long before the Forest of Aremberg. Museo didn't have the move. One by one they crumbled, but Marty did his job well. He got in the early move of the day and was hampering the breakaway, but it wasn't to be. And it can't always work out, but this has been one of the finest Paris-Roubaix I think I've ever commentated on. Well, Yatislav Ekimov right now must be thinking, how am I going to outfox these guys? He never really has been a, a huge winner of races on the open row, but I tell you one thing, he's a man who probably has more titles in this breakaway than anybody else. Olympic champion on two occasions, world champion, and a real great bike rider on the road. Right now, he must be thinking through the back of his mind, Phil, how to outfox everybody, because we are now just starting the final serious section of cobblestones. It's known as two towards the end at M. It's a long section of cobbles, it's 1.4 kilometres, but I have a feeling uh, they've got a little bit of a problem with the graphics here right now, because that 300-metre <laughs> section is the last section that the riders face before they come onto the velodrome here in Roubaix. Peter van Pietergem is the man on form and looking to make himself the first man since Roger de Vlaming got, did the double of Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. It's a pretty dangerous section of cobblestones too, but despite the fact you've got nice smooth road on either side, you zigzag across in these corners, and this is where Henny Kuiper nearly lost the race in 1983 when he was leading by around about 40 seconds. If you snick your tyre on the side there where the tarmac meets the cobblestone and you are down and you are out, 
no mistakes can be possibly allowed amongst these three now you see the ridges i'm talking about this is a dreadful stretch of road here van petergum the great belgian who lives in the heart of flanders where cobblestones grow on trees he knows all about them what about Pieriel, oh, this wonderful italian who doesn't get these rough roads back home in italy and I suspect that Ekimov, who lives in Italy, knows all about them as well. Well, he's a big, strong bike rider, the man on the front. This is the chasing group right now. Daniele Nardello there, covered by Mark Wouters, followed there by Roman Weinsteins. We pull back and look a little further up the road. The last official time gap we had to these three chasers was 30 seconds, then a further 20 seconds back to Serves Canavan and Sergei Ivanov. I have a feeling these three men are not going to catch the three leaders because they are all working very well together and they do really appear, the three men at the front, to be the strongest men in the bike race this afternoon. And Paul, what an I know, ironic racing, cycle racing is. Oh, well, what's happened here? This Problem. is Nardello. Nardello has a flat tyre. The injustice of it all here. Nardello with a front wheel, surely just a few seconds. A quick change and he'll be away again, but right on him shortly would be his teammate Aldag, who's only just been dropped. Well, you, what can you say when a man suffers luck like that? Well, this section of cobbles, although it's a, supposedly a fairly easy one, has seen... Taffy. There is Taffy back. He's also a man who's had a lot of problems as well. In that group, there is Ivanov, also Cerves Canavan, so Nardello will have to get onto the back of that train. And there is Aldag. He's been also picked up by the flying train of Andrea Taffy. So Aldag, having had a rather terrible time over the last 10 kilometres or so, this bike race really is unbelievable. There's a bit of action every minute of the day. Well, I was about to say before the flat tyres and Ardella, what an ironic sport it is because, you know, we've always cheered home uh, George Hincapi last year. In fact, it was uh, Tom Bonin on US Postal who got the highest ever team finish by third. And now we're relying heavily in the absence of Hincapi on a Russian rider on their team. Here we have now, coming up here, Roman Weinsteins. Grimacing, how hard is this Paris-Roubaix? The same should be said too for him. Mark Wouters, Roman Weinsteins. Wouters having the ride of his life as well here. The man from Belgium, the former Belgian champion for a very short period, a leader of the Tour de France on Belgian soil a couple of years ago. He's the time trial champion of Belgium and his best finish in this event, seventh in 2000. It just goes back to what I've always said about this bike race, Phil, Paris-Roubaix. To come here, you really have to love this bike race, and all of the men who come to ride this race are super motivated to do it. If you don't want to do it, then you might as well stay at home, and that's what uh, Bernardino has to say about all the guys who complain about Paris-Roubaix these days. If you don't like it, stay away and come back another day. They're not very far away from M now, and this is a very good launch pad for an attack. Five kilometres to go to the finish. Three miles, three miles to the stadium and a massive crowd here has watched one of the greatest editions of Paris-Roubaix. The World Cup holder here, if he makes a mess of the sprint, he's assured of third place. And that will be enough to give him a lovely lead in the World Cup. And he's actually beginning to look forward to that competition. He says there are a number of races which he can do well in, if not uh, races like, of course, the hillier ones like the Ace Bast on the Ace. Well, I think the Amstel Gold race suits him quite a bit. I'm not quite sure what's happening to Van Pietigam right now. He's just stretching that leg down on the inside every now and again. I think he's this, got cramp. This is the moment when cramp could start to appear. They're now turning into M. This is the centre of the town where Alain Bondu comes from, a, another former very good individual pursuiter. There's a problem again, Johan Museo. Not having a great day on the cobblestones of Hem here and another back wheel puncture for him. And not a great exit from Paris-Roubaix. But still, let's not forget... This man has been one of the greatest classic riders of the last 10 years. And this will be an image I'm sure we'll see a lot of in the years to come. The Lion of Flanders, three times a winner. No panic at all. His race already lost here as he takes a new wheel. The crowd applaud and look at a remarkable man. And you can hear the cheer for yourself as he gets back into the hell. That's almost exactly the same point <laughs> that Henny Kuiper it had is. the same problem in 1983. Ten years ago, almost to the day. Johan Museo now will just cruise to the podium and the velodrome here at Roubaix after what has been, I would say, a very long and illustrious career. This is now the sharp end of Paris-Roubaix. We are about three and a half kilometres to go to the finish. Dario Pieri, and they've got a lead of 35 seconds here. Pentagon Van Pentagon on the left. 
and coupled up there with Ekimov. This is the chase group of Wouters and Weinsteins. I don't think they're going to see the front runners now, not this close to the finish. Well, the thing is they're only separated by 35 seconds. You can see the gaggle of cars just up ahead, and that is the car. And those are probably, look at Weinsteins. This is the strange thing. It's the first time these riders have felt the heat in the north of France for the last couple of weeks. So the temperature going up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, around about 70, degree, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I should say, 20 degrees Celsius. But it's not affected these men, although I do have a, a wonder about the man in the white jersey there. I saw him making a similar manoeuvre just a few moments ago. They're not too far to go to the stadium right now, Phil. They're in the outskirts of Roubaix, probably three kilometres to go to the finish. If that, Paul, if that, and there's a huge buzz in the stadium now of anticipation as they await the arrival of a three-up sprint, not like last year. I suspect that uh, Van Pietergum is not feeling great. He's hoping there is the stadium now. He is hoping, the lock gaps in the crowd, by the way, that's the old velodrome wall. And you can't sit on a banking of some 50 degrees. We're looking down on Roubaix, a city which has welcomed this event since 1896. We'll need to go to the record books when I can think of one as exciting as this. Here's the attack from Ekimov, the reaction from Van Pietergum. I don't think Van Pietergum realised, I don't think he was planning his own move, but they're all together again. Well, they're about one and a half kilometres now from the entrance onto the velodrome, and I don't know, Phil, I can't really put a name onto the man who I think is stronger than anybody else in this. It's a question of survival after 260 kilometres. Ekimov is the most experienced rider. The man in second position there is the fastest rider, and the man in the red jersey at the back, I think, is probably the strongest rider. So pick any one of the three. I'd very much like to see Yatislav Ekimov win, though. Oh, you must have shown your bias, Paul. Well, you can, all right. <laughs> well, thanks very much. But, you know, the strongest man, the Two fastest kilometers. man, is the man at the back in the white jersey. But he keeps shaking his legs, but this may well just be an idea to try and fox the other men in the breakaway. He's a really fast sprinter, and he's not scared of the track at all. He will try and use the banking to the best of his advantage. The reason is that when he's taking part in the winter circuit, he rides the, the six days of Ghent. So he knows just exactly how to plunge down the banking. But don't worry about Ekimov's track craft after because he's also a pretty good man when it comes to using the banking to his best will. These are all winners of Paris Bay today, but only one can cross the finishing line. Ekimov, I feel, will go possibly down the final little stretch of Pave before they swing into the stadium. He won't show any fears of the track, no, but he likes to ride the track alone because that's what he did on the track. He was a pursuiter, either in the team or individual. He was also the world hour record holder. The entree on the right to a factory, by the way. Bit of a worry for the riders, but it's closed today as they continue as a massive crowd here this year. We will shortly flip to the left and down the centre, and then we are into the last 1,000 metres. A very nervous moment now for all of these riders flicking onto the last section of cobblestones here, the Espace Charles Coupelon, 300 metres at the end of that. They'll take a right-hand turn onto the good road once again, and then they will burst into the stadium. And still not one man looking any stronger than the other. I tell you what, though, 171, the leader of the World Cup, he's thinking about the double. There's the Flamme Rouge. 250 metres now to the entrance to the circuit. They'll cross the finish line and then face the full 500-metre lap. Van Pietergum wants the third slot, he's the sprinter, Ekimov has been forced to lead. The crowd are about to erupt here in this old stadium. And in fact, Ekimov playing his final card and making the sprinter go in front, forcing Dario Pieri now to lead them out. The man with the worst finish of the three at Roubaix, that's when they get here. His best finish is 11th, the others have had a second and a third. Here's the turn as they come in, hear the crowd for yourself. A marvellous applause here, and Van Pietergum, the sprinter, isn't in the best place. Well, he's not too worried. He's a crafty bike rider, you know, Van Pietergum, keeping up the banking. Look at this. This will be one of the, the biggest track sprints we've seen here. Pieri being forced up into second position there. Watch out for Ekimov. I think he might try and make one final burst. He reckons he's got the 500 metres charge that could surprise everybody. Look at this, Phil. Very rarely do you see these men using it. the banking in the velodrome. There's the bell. 500 metres to go. You still can't pick a winner. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm expecting them to stop still and have a track stand here because they all deserve the victory. Pieri, though, is taking them out towards the 200 metres marker. 
It's like commentating on the World Track Championship now, and look at the man in second place, looking for the whereabouts of Ekimov, as in come the chase group now, as they come onto the back straight. Now Pieri has gonna, is going to start it, I think Ekimov will start it. Ekimov surely will die for the inside now, and the, wait, 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 goes Van Pietergum, Van Pietergum keeps Pieri on the top, and still Ekimov is waiting, now he goes, and Van Pietergum has missed it! Has he got the kick left in those legs? I think he has, and here comes Dario Pieri right on the line. He's done it! Van Pietergum becomes the first man since Roger de Vlamic in 1977 to win the Tour of Flanders and the Paris-Roubaix. And the gracious congratulations there of Dario Pieri. What a result. Great result, you can see now coming up for fourth place here. There is Mark Wouters just ahead of Sergei Ivanov. Yatislav Ekimov, Phil, he knew what he had to do, he knew when he had to do it, but there was no outfoxing Peter Van Pietergem. Aldag now coming up to the line ahead of Taffy, but watch out around the outside there because that is Nardello as well. Taffy brings them home. Sixth place, I think, for Taffy as he crosses the line there in that chase group. What a wonderful, wonderful event this has been. There's a view from the way up on the gantry with our camera. And the winner, Peter van Petergum. He salutes the crowd here. He applauds the crowd. He has the right to feel happy with himself. He has won one of the finest uh, races from Paris to Roubaix in its 101-year history. This was superb. And just a week ago, to the day, he was winner in his home country of Belgium of the Tour of Flanders. There's the melee. Gets 100 World Cup points, becomes a clear leader after three races in that competition. This great rider from Belgium. Now comes the big crush from the photographers in the hope that they will get the words that count. The riders continuing to drift onto the track and go out on their lap and a half while Van Pietergum, just like uh, the Pied Piper, leads everybody into the track centre. En opposition à celui de Dario Pieri, le grand italien qui obtient ici une place identique à celle du Tour des Flandres. Et il termine à la deuxième place. Et qui m'a à 38 ans, et eh bien à 37 ans du moins, réalise un superbe parcours et termine en troisième position. Dans un instant, nous vous donnerons le classement officiel concernant les 20 premiers de l'épreuve. Stewie, it's a pretty tough, pretty tough bike race, eh? Oh, mate. Hell of the north. It's a hard day. You seem to be in pretty good form. You went across the, a couple of moves with people, but it was, uh, I think, one of the toughest Paris Roubaix I've witnessed in the last 10 years. Yeah, I had two punches at pretty vital moments, and the second one was 10k to go, and uh, it put me a long way behind, and I somehow got back onto the, the group there at the finish, but, uh, oh, mate, fuel tank was empty. People say that Paris Roubaix is very difficult in the wet conditions, but today's proved pretty tough in the dry. Uh, the dry, it's just so fast, um, and the wet, you know, it's a lot more slow and technical, but when it's dry, it's just absolutely flat out. You want to come back? Oh, we'll always come back, won't we? Thanks. Tom, it turned out being a very difficult race for Quick Step, and maybe that's the price you have to pay when the team are the number one favourites. Well, I don't know. Uh, we could have won the race, but uh, I think everybody had his part uh, of bad luck today. And uh, it's hard to win a really fast Roubaix like this if you have bad luck. If it's harder than uh, when it's wet, when the difference is uh, when you're good, the difference is better, bigger when it's wet. Today was really fast, and it's hard to get back. Uh, I was in a crash at, after 90 k. It took me 30 k to get back in the front, and. Uh, those things, uh, they make you, all the power you lose in those parts uh, is, is unnecessary effort, and uh, they make you lose the race. Johan Museo had a lot of bad luck today, but he didn't really seem to be the dominant Johan Museo of his years gone by. Oh, just like I said, uh, it's easier when it's really hard to be dominant. When it's really fast like today, uh, it's harder to be dominant. Despite this race being an absolutely mad race, you want to come back and do well in it next year? Of course. 
Yatislavic, very difficult at 37 years of age to keep the motivation to come to a tough race like Paris Bay. How do you do it? Well, you know, you could never say that you're old if you feel, I mean, if you can compete the guys who's 25, 30 years old, that means you're still still young and still still doing well. And uh, first of all, I have a confidence myself that uh, Paris Rube, one of the one, one of the, my favorite races. If it uh, stays a dry condition, like today, just the perfect, just perfect for me. It was a nicely timed effort by you to ride across uh, Dario Pieri. Once you made the con connection with the front group, did you believe you could win the race? You know, I try. I mean, when the Dario Pieri was lost my wheel on one of the last uh, sections, then probably I, I mean I, I start guessing. Oh, that's probably my turn uh, to today to make a solo. And I just kept going over the top. But then, okay, then the, the strongest guys came back, <laughs> Peter Van Pietigem. Well, on the track, Peter Van Pietigem, we know, has got a lot of experience in riding races like the Gen 6 day. But did you think maybe you could outfox him? Yeah, I, I couldn't say that I, that I make some mistakes on the track. I, I mean, I took the most sweet spot, like third spot, with a little, like, five meters uh, gap so it was everything perfect the only things i missed just my speed <laughs> just my all times all days speed but good for us postal to once again get a man on the podium at paris Roubaix. oh yeah this is a great effort for our, for our sponsor berry floor us united states postal service and i think uh, all guys in the team are proud that we have such sponsors and uh, so we have such a team that's perfect. Thank you. Well, Roger, we saw a lot of you on the TV, but uh, first attempt at this bike race, pretty mad, isn't it? I was absolute carnage from our, from the crash after 90 Ks. Seriously, I, I reckon I could count the number of kilometers on one hand where we were riding easy. From then on, it was just Parve completely up block, and then ease up, and then again accelerate for the next section of cobbles. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, every, everybody tells me that it's, um, this, uh, you know, it's right, like no other race this race, and yeah, I can tell you, it's like no other race. It was incredible. Was it? Did it live up to your expectations? What was it like riding onto the velodrome here? Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I've dreamed about doing this race since I was six years old, and uh, oh, I'm just so happy out now. If I don't ride the Tour de France, I don't care. This riding onto the velodrome here was absolutely incredible. But even out on the roads, I was with the uh, Museo's group for the last 20Ks, and the am atmosphere on the cobbles was absolutely incredible. On the last three sections, seriously, I just couldn't hold myself back from laughing. It was just, it was just so much fun, so much ambience, and yeah, this, this, this has made my career. For all the days where I've been riding in the rain, training on my own, this is why I do it. You're going to come back one year when it's wet? I'd love to. Now I've done it dry, you've got to do, you've got to do the real Paris-Roubaix now. So, yeah, hopefully next year. Thanks very much. Mark, what a brilliant bike race this has been today. Uh, a little bit disappointed at only coming in fourth. Yeah, I was uh, three, lost uh, part of uh, Pavea was uh, pulling, and I thought a go. And Fapetigan was behind me, and he go one time more, and I was uh, fucked, and that was a little bit uh, shit for me, but uh, yeah. It was unbelievably fast today, and that seemed to be the problem. A lot of riders were having crashes, and on a wet Paris Roubaix, it may be a little bit easier to come back. Yeah, I was uh, always in the front, and uh, I think it was a good decision for me. But yeah, you must always uh, looking for crashes, and uh, yeah, it was a very bad, uh, fast race for to today. It was very difficult to go with Van Pietigen when he went. He seemed to wait till just the right time, and. He's got the acceleration to go across a gap. Yeah, he is the best rider uh, this this week, and uh, yeah, for Peter is is good. You like this race? <laughs> yes, I like it. <laughs> well, uh, Peter, congratulations. Thank you. One quick question: What an incredible week! You got the race that you wanted to win the Tour of Flanders, but making it Tour of Flanders in Paris Roubaix that really is a very special week for you. Uh, yeah. Went two times uh, the two most beautiful uh, classic is, is it's unbelievable. But uh, for me, uh, the greatest ob objective this season was uh, Paris Roubaix. I said this winter, uh, Paris Roubaix was for me the most important uh, race. But I won to the Flanders, so everybody says ah, it will be finished uh, for. 
compete with him. Uh, it's always the same. He stopped after uh, one victory. But uh, Paris-Roubaix was my race and I wanted to do a big uh, result and I won. Uh, you came onto the velodrome finish. Now, I know you ride a lot of track during the winter, but you, were you not a little bit worried uh, about the presence of Yatislav Ekimov? Well, I think uh, the two riders were a speci a specialist. Uh, the one is very fast and Ekimov is also a good rider on track. But uh, I know I'm very fast and on the track and I take a good position, I take uh, the most uh, uh, comfortable play, uh, place on the virage and you go down and you are lance à la lance. Two wins now in the World Cup and uh, you must be seriously thinking about the possibility of winning it overall. Amstel Gold Race suits you pretty well. I hope the legs will be good and uh, I w I, I'm going to try the two races uh, to do big result and uh, take the most uh, the most points and uh, it's that's important so there's the result for you. Six hours and 11 minutes in the saddle for Van Pietergun ahead of Pierre Ekimov, Bouters, Andrea Tappi getting fifth, Dane Stain sixth, and Surveys Canavan coming in in seventh place. Another former winner there. Nardello had such rotten luck, but still finished eighth. And the battling Aldag ninth with Servai, Sergei Ivanov, another man in trouble towards the end. He finished in tenth position. What a marvellous race this really was, 101 years, we thought we'd seen it all, today we saw a fantastic race ball. Just over our shoulder here is the remnants of the original velodrome, back to 1896, but I bet you what, I bet it hasn't witnessed such great racing as we saw today. It was fantastic riding, wasn't it? Well, it's absolutely superb, you know, we all dream about having a wet Paris-Roubaix because we reckon that is absolutely dramatic, but today I think we saw more action over every section of cobblestones that we've seen in many years. And let's not forget, we showed you all 26 sectors. It was a marathon commentary, but the time passed so quickly. It does. You know, when you get involved in the race like that, you're thinking about which section of cobbles is coming up next, and it really didn't feel like four hours of commentary. No, it didn't. Star of the day for you, very difficult choice. It's tough, you know. I think coming onto the velodrome there, there were three guys, and each one of them, we both said it, had the chance of winning. They all deserved to win, but only one man can cross the line in first place. You've got to give it to Van Piet again because he came up with the win. But Yatislav Ekimov, 37 years of age, eight months of retirement away from the sport, coming back to win, absolutely brilliant. Indeed. Whichever way you look at it, this was a great edition of Paris Bay. And we're only 101 years young. Until our next video, from Paul Sherwin, from me, Phil Liggett, goodbye. For a long time since I've been here, these are the showers at the end of Paris-Roubaix. A slight change this year, they've actually put a name plaque from all of the previous winners of the bike race. You know when you see the riders jubilant on the track centre, or in a moment of despair, well then they get directed to here, just immediately after the finish. These are the showers. Every bike rider who finishes the race, either on the velodrome or out on the course, comes here to get changed after the bike race. The stories that this place holds must be absolutely incredible because many of them never actually leave the shower area. The riders will talk to the soigneur, they'll talk to the doctor. They will, they will all have a story to tell. Good luck, bad luck. But when you come here into the showers at the end of Paris-Roubaix, so many of the stories unfold. Stories that maybe sometimes we never actually hear when they wash away the grime and the taste of victory. 
or the stories of defeat.